maybe a minute or two. Uh, while we're waiting for folks to hop on, I just wanted to um, take a moment to to thank again um, everybody on on Bones End um, with whom I worked to get yesterday's session pulled together. Um, was thrilled to see the turnout for that, um, and hopefully it was useful for folks at Bone. Um, I know certainly. Both the members had some takeaways and we look forward to thinking about potential implications uh, for the space development plan and for other um, BOEM COSA engagements in the future. So um, thank you again to, to the folks that helped pull that together. All right, I'm still not seeing everybody we had on the closed session, I don't think, but maybe it's just that my list has gotten too long here. Um, I do want us to start with just some introductions. Um, and again, the way I did it, yes, I'll do it um, again the way that I did it yesterday, which is I'll start with a few housekeeping items uh, and then we'll do our um, committee introductions, um, uh, any sort of uh, words to kick us off from our co chairs. And then we'll turn uh, to the presentations on updates regarding our first in class study. Um, so just in terms of housekeeping items, uh, I mentioned this yesterday, but just as a reminder that COSA is a standing committee of the National Academy is constituted to provide ongoing individual input to bone science and assessment programs. Um, so they do not, the committee members do not uh, develop any consensus advice, but rather provide input on their own behalf and not on behalf of the academies. Um, we will be recording this meeting. I'll ask folks to please stay muted unless called upon to speak. And I will um, look for the raised hand feature for any uh, Q&A or um, comments. And then, um, let's see. We do have a couple of scheduled breaks today, but um, you know, as always, if you need to take breaks in between, uh, not a problem at all. Please just be sure to turn off your cameras and make sure you're muted so that we don't create any interruptions. I think those are all of my short housekeeping items um, and we'll get started with some committee introductions and I will start with our co-chairs, Scott Cameron and then Rod Mather. Uh uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good good morning to those of you in the Western time zones. Um, welcome to, to day two of our spring COSA meeting, uh, and uh, really glad to have, have you all here. My name is uh, Scott Cameron. I am a geologist. I spent the first 32 years of my career working for Shell Oil, mainly in the offshore uh, E&P projects, and the last 10 years consulting. And during that time, I have been a member of COSA now in my sixth year. So looking looking forward to today's session. Uh, good day, everybody. I'm Rod Mather. Um, I am a underwater archeologist and a historian at the University of Rhode Island. I um, run a graduate program that sits at the intersection of anthropology and history and archeology. span And uh, with Scott, I co-chair COSA and I've been on the committee for a number of years. Thank you. Jack, we'll turn to you next. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jack Barth. I'm a professor of oceanography at Oregon State University. Uh, I work in the coastal ocean, lots of ocean observing projects, both fixed and mobile gear. Uh, I also lead a program at Oregon State that combines everything marine from natural social sciences and the arts and humanities. Thank you, Jack. I'll turn next to James Flynn. Hi, my name is James Flynn. I'm a, a atmospheric scientist at the University of Houston. Uh, we look at a lot of air quality issues, including um, relationship with uh, coastal meteorology and offshore emissions as it impacts uh, terrestrial sources. Thank you, Katrine. 
Hi, my name is Katrin Eichen. I'm a professor of marine biology at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, I'm a benthic ecologist and mostly work on seafloor community uh, diversity issues and food webs. And uh, I mostly work in the Arctic and the Gulf of Alaska. Thank you. I'm looking to see, um, is Kelsey on the line? Unless she was in our closed session. I don't see her on here. If Kelsey is able to join us, we'll come back to her. Uh, I'll turn next to Susan. Hi, I'm Susan Parks. I'm a professor of biology at Syracuse University. My research is focused on marine mammal uh, acoustic communication and the impacts of noise. Thank you. Carrie? Morning, good afternoon, folks. Uh, Carrie Pomeroy, uh, research social scientist at the Institute of Marine Sciences at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, my background is in applied sociology and anthropology combined with marine policy, work on human dimensions of fisheries and coastal and marine space use. Thank you. Thank you. And have I missed any other COSA members? I know we've got several that are either unavailable today or joining later. So um, if I miss anybody that's on the line currently, please let me know. Okay, excellent. Scott and Rod, um, any initial uh, comments from you before we delve into our agenda? Uh, no, I, I I think you you teed it up very well, Stacy. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just to say I'm looking very much looking forward to today. Um, yesterday's meeting was was very interesting. Um, lots of food for thought. I'm sure today will be the same. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing about um, the first in class report. Scott was was part of that effort, so he has a lot more um, detailed knowledge than than I do and some others of us do. So anyway, I'm looking very much looking forward to that today, and also looking forward to hearing about the um, National Academy's other activities. Thanks, Rod. So I think with that, Brian, if you're ready, we're a little ahead of schedule, but happy to turn it over to you to get started. Um, and uh, really looking forward to the updates. Yeah, thanks, Stacy, And uh, thanks, everyone on the COSA. It's a pleasure to be here with you this uh, morning slash afternoon. Um, so, um, the presentation today is really kind of status update on um, what Bowen's been working on with respect to the first in class report or the attributes of a first in class environmental science program. So uh, Bill Brown asked uh, me to lead this effort with a small group of people from the Office of Environmental Programs within Bowen. Uh, my background, just for reference, is I'm the chief of the branch of environmental consultations within the division environmental assessment. Um, and so I lead a team that handles a lot of the really tough programmatic consultations or helps advise or create policy around those for a lot of the um, NEPA as well as non-NEPA statutes. Uh, my background is in marine archaeology but also I have advanced degrees in wood science and natural resource science and management. Um, a lot of experience working on how wooden shipwrecks were preserved in the marine environment. Uh, I also serve as the Bureau's federal preservation officer. So with that, um, we'll get started here. Um, Je Jess is gonna go ahead and uh, she's gonna man the slides for me. So let's go to the next slide. So a little bit of the background. First of all, I wanted to really thank the ad hoc committee for their time and effort in preparing um, this attributes of a first in class report for Boehm's environmental studies program. And that was work was chaired by Craig Johnson. And I know several current members of COSA, including Scott and Kevin contributed to that report. So it's got a wealth of information. I encourage people if they haven't read it, um, <laughs> read it. Um, I basically, uh, we have been digging into it and becoming intimate. So just a brief overview, the report was released in, released in 2022. Um, it was really related to Bohm's aspiration to achieve first-in-class status for their youth-inspired science program. 
and it's guided by uh, Boehm's long-term vision for the environmental science program, studies programs to be the first in class or the best research program possible in the context of Boehm's mission and constraints. Next slide. So uh, this is, um, goes into the committee's framework and it really follows a systems approach to evaluate progress toward, toward achieving first in class. And, in, and basically it has a series of evaluating questions and examples that are grouped around key attributes. Uh, there's cross-cutting attributes and then there's core attributes and process outputs and impacts with innovation cutting across all of those um, attributes. Next slide. The work, um, the committee spent a lot of work um, gathering information, including holding virtual workshops with other science programs, um, delving into DOI's Office of Planning and Performance Management, looking around the Evidence Act, um, as well as diving into the relevant literature. Next slide. This just gives you an idea about the level of information and chief categories of the various attributes. So the first in class report has identified 18 attributes in five basic groups. You got the cross cutting attributes that are at the top of the screen. And you'll see that these are gonna be color coordinated and there's little symbols associated with it to help orient people through the presentation. But it's also allows us to, um, as we're unpacking this and kind of developing, you know, the relationship schematics on our end, when we're trying to understand the relationships between these different attributes, it helps us to track which attributes are flowing into what other attributes, especially as you look at the cross cutting. Um, but you have, you know, the, the cross cutting attributes, then you have the actual, you know, looking at it from a systems analysis point of view, you have the process attributes, which are in dark blue, the output attributes, which are in um, light purple, and the impact attributes, which are in gold. And then at the bottom are the underlying attributes in dark purple for innovation. So the report also provided 23 distinct examples framing the attributes and developed 72 sample evaluation questions. So just have this out here because it was a lot to unpack. And so we're still working on that. And this is something that we're gonna be continuing to work on in, in the coming years. Next slide. The four chief recommendations from the report is Boehm should develop basically how we're gonna measure success in each attribute, implement improvement actions, involvement of external advisors, and it's institutionalizing evaluation improvement processes and procedures. Next slide. So where are we now? So this is uh, one of my favorite quotes when looking at doing kind of systematic uh, research. Um, this is from Alfred North Whitehead, which the only simplicity to be trusted is the simplicity to be found on the far side of complexity. So really where we're at right now is really evaluating and understanding and making sense of the complexity. And the first in class report is really helpful in providing a framework to do that systematically. So we're probably a far way around, <laughs> away from the simplicity side of things. But right now we're, as you'll see in this, we're evaluating a lot of our different processes and we'll hope to show in this presentation some areas that we have made improvements on or you know, advancing and other ones that we are going to need you know, continued assistance and continue time to unpack. So um, Jessica, next slide. Go back one slide, Jessica, sorry. Yeah, so this is really where we are right now. Um, and although things have, things have developed in each of these attributes, um, but the efforts have mostly been from the ground up and we still have a lot of work to do for them to be institutionalized. Um, and that's one of the big steps, you know, one of the big steps and reasons that we requested the consensus report 
So again, we're working to evaluate BOEM's uh, work related to each of the attributes. And that's the first step to moving towards a first-in-class environmental program. And this presentation is really a high-level look at BOEM's environmental programs and other activities within the context of the first-in-class attributes. And I specifically talk about environmental programs, although the report focused on the environmental studies program and the science aspect, that doesn't operate on its own. It operates within the context of the environmental programs, which then operates within the framework of BOEM organization within the framework of DOI, and then the other cabinet level, the administration priorities. So the examples in this presentation are representative, but no means inclusive of the work that our environmental staff have done or and are doing each and every day. So if I'm not including something I've had to summarize, I've had to summarize a lot of work to make the presentation tenable. And so if I've missed anything or I fail to, you know, give attribution to a region or program office or individual, that's a reflection on, on me and my choices and, and not on the great work of the amazing individuals in this bureau. Next slide. So the five cross-cutting attributes, really, these, if you look at it, the overall nature of these cross-cutting attributes are kind of encompassed in the systems approach, which I think a lot of the, uh, the report focuses on. But these are things that we need to be aware of and really focus on at a high level, because as I said, the environmental studies program is nested within other organizations within the Bureau. And so we really have to get a handle on this. And the cross-cutting attribute one is really important that articulates sphere of influence. And, you know, to look at the Franklin Covey kind of, you know, understanding of how things work, you know, we need to first understand what is in our sphere of control <laughs> to be able to understand how we can exert you know and and influence other parts of the organization or either and and either external partners so it's an important element you know but this the cross cutting attributes there are elements of this that are not in specifically the environmental studies program or the environmental programs control there we have to rely on you know, external processes and uh, priorities and working with others. And so the cross-cutting attributes really kind of frames that kind of connecting what we do on an everyday basis with those externalities that we have to look at. Another way to think about it is I often think about when I'm doing strategic work or systems work, the concepts of zoom in and zoom out, right? So these cross-cutting attributes really focus on the zooming out you know, where are you going? What is your vision? How are you communicating? How are you connecting with, with other partners externally, internally? And then you have to zoom back in to make sure that you're actually, you know, what you're actually doing and how you're doing it is going to meet those goals. So I look at the cross-cutting attributes as kind of that zoom out function that is really important. And then more on you know, the process outputs, impacts, and innovation is kind of zooming back in. And so it's a constant tension between those things. And the cross-cutting attributes provide a framework for looking at that. Um, one of the things I noticed when going through here is, you know, I think one of the things that I thought would have been helpful to be explicitly called out, I think it's embedded in some of these other cross-cutting attributes, um, like fostering uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and systems thinking, and articulate sphere of influence. But there's really a need on the workforce side to have a resilient, engaged, and agile workforce where people are doing meaningful work that is valuable and valued. And that's something that I think that from Bowen's perspective in my work in this field is really, it's an important and critical element is to have that engaged workforce and resilient and be able to pivot and work on different priorities that are outside our immediate control, but we have to respond to. Next slide. 
So the, I'm going to lump the first two or discuss the first two of the cross-cutting attributes. So the vision on first in class is focused narrowly on the environmental studies program. But again, as I've said before, we need to contextualize this vi vision within a broader defined purpose for the environmental programs across BOEM, as well as research that is occurring outside of the environmental studies program and even our agency, but is potentially relevant. So to clearly and effectively articulate BOEM's environmental program sphere of influence, we need to agree upon our sphere of control. And to do this, we need to discuss a defining purpose or vision for the environmental programs as a whole in which the environmental studies program operates. And this again will help to focus the research priorities and research strategy that will allow BOEM to make timely decisions on research funding and partnerships. And BOEM should also reevaluate how we're articulating and disseminating, disseminating organizational priorities to help shape and focus the development of the scientific research agenda. This is challenging with many seemingly competing needs across three regions and three different program areas, as well as responding to shifts in priorities and legislative mandates, as we discussed yesterday with, you know, having, you know, offshore wind energy is a major focus of the administration, but now we're also looking at developing a program for carbon sequestration and storage, as well as having additional responsibility over the territories. So there's a lot of things to have to look at. So in order to do this, we are going, we're proposing and having a BOEM environmental meeting this fall. And these are gonna be two of the key attributes that we're gonna discuss as part of that meeting. So stay tuned on that. Next slide. So when you look at engaging in systems thinking and analysis, the environmental studies program looks at its systems through a strategic framework, an internal 10 year forward looking needs analysis that we affectionately call the decadal vision and an annual studies development planning process. All three interrelated processes engage leadership and environmental program staff, both assessment and sciences from across BOEM. Unpacking how the different parts of BOEM interact, especially between the headquarters, regional and program off office environmental, environmental offices will be a focus in the coming year, especially since the strategic framework and the decadal vision are several years old at this point. I enjoyed, the I enjoyed the first in class attributes report, their discussion on gathering and learning from relevant data to understand and improve BOEM's interdependencies. So a challenge that BOEM faces is the rapidly changing priorities and expanded responsibilities with limited staff and resources to accomplish the work. To be successful, BOEM will need to work as one bureau to develop efficiencies, long-term partnerships, and new methods of working across organizational units. As you will see throughout the presentation, BOEM is doing aspects of a lot of the attribute work, some better than others, but not in a holistic or systemic, systematic way. Next slide, please. Some of the work that we're doing with engaging in systems is really how are we you know, responding to feedback? And here is a few examples of past efforts and continual efforts that uh, the Bureau has engaged in. So we're really gonna be looking at how to focus this process and make it more of a continual process instead of doing it periodically. Cause I think that's really important. It's really challenging to do, but I think once that BOEM identifies its priorities, processes, outputs and impacts, we're gonna focus on or keep an eye towards how do we systematically receive that continuous feedback and communicate across organizational units and partners to focus the science on key challenges that need to be addressed. Next slide, please. On partnerships, we do, if you look at our studies development, um, our strategic framework for our environmental studies program and our, and our studies development planning process, we definitely encourage you know, studies to support collaboration with native communities whenever, whenever appropriate and feasible. And we will talk about this um, a little bit under the diverse investigators in um, one of the process attributes. But what's really important about this is that we finally now have the ability or 
be given approval to use a, a funding mechanism embedded in the Take Pride in America Act to enter into cooperative agreements directly with tribal nations. And this is really important because previously, we, BOEM was only able to really enter into third party agreements with Alaska Native and tribal communities. So this is a large step forward in actually really being able to meet this partners and collaborate effectively with uh, groups that are affected by BOEM's activities. So, and again, partnering is always encouraged with other federal agencies, academic organizations, other nonprofits or commercial enterprise to achieve shared mission needs. Next slide, Jessica. So as this slide indicates or illustrates, we do partner quite extensively on our studies research, um, most of it on a study by study basis. We do have some of our regions and program offices. They do have strategic partnerships with federal partners and others. For instance, we work closely with the USGS who has Otter Continental Shelf Funds for partnering with us on studies. And I know the Marine Minerals Program um, works closely with the US Army Corps of Engineers. Both our Gulf of Mexico regions and Alaska regions work with the Coastal Marine Institutes. And we've engaged with joint industry programs and the National Ocean Partnership Programs. Having said this, most of our studies propose partnerships on an ad hoc basis and not really in a systematic manner. And I'll highlight this now, but I'm gonna come back to it at the end of the presentation. I think that BOEM could use the assistance of COSA in looking how to develop long-term partnerships more strategically for key research priorities and to regularly analyze the cost benefits for these type of partnerships. And I will also mention that if uh, the COSA members have any comments or questions, uh, they can just put it in the chat. I know some of our team will be monitoring uh, the Zoom chat um, during this presentation. So they, if you have something, an idea that you want to throw in there, go ahead and do that and we'll flag it and, and bring it back up for discussion later. So I do want to point out that one of the cross-cutting activities that I believe that we have made the most um, progress in, next slide, please, Jessica, is really the cross-cutting um, attribute five, the fosters diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and this is in large part through the efforts of the working members of the Justice, Equality, Diversity, Inclusion Charter or JEDI. Um, and the, and the, basis, the, the purpose of this charter is action for Native Americans and individuals from Black and other groups historically disadvantaged by injustice, inequality, or exclusion. And also I'd like to mention specifically Brianna Smith, um, she was instrumental in leading and championing this important initiative along with the other working group members. Next slide. But this also stems from uh, the Department of the Interior efforts and they developed a strategic plan to advance diversity, equity, inclusion um, in the federal workforce. And they have three main objectives here um, that you could see. They're recruiting and hire, recruitment and hiring, inclusive and safe workspace, and professional growth and advancement. Next slide. So on June 2022, BOEM established its first ever BOEM DEIA step-down implementation plan. So it's basically taking the DOI strategic plan and priorities and then stepping down into how we are going to focus on those priority areas that were identified in that. And I know the next few slides will illustrate some of the work that BOEM has been doing uh, to both encourage the surface level diversity as well as the deep diversity as described in the first in class report. So, and I know one of the key evaluation questions, um, the second one within this cross cutting attribute asked, does the organization have a diversity, equity, and inclusion officer? And as shown here, we are currently in the process of hiring an individual in that role. And we also, there are funding resources for positions, and those were allocated to establish the BOEM diversity and inclusion office. So we are making process in that, we are making progress in that. And I know that the 2020 report cited in the first in class report um, that report by McKinsey and company kind of cited, 
you know, five areas and actions to foster diversity. So I hope you see in these slides, you know, components of those, you know, ensure representation of diverse talent, strengthen leadership accountability and capabilities through training and learning. Next slide, Jess. The enable equality of opportunity through fairness and transparency, transparency, promote openness and tackle microaggressions. And the last one they, they talk about is foster belonging through unequivocal support for diversity and attitudes, belief and values. And the first in class report describes this as deep diversity. But you can see that we are working on four of these priority areas that meet a lot of the needs described in the first in class attributes. Next slide. To get into a little bit more on the deep diversity is how, how are we actually bringing on um, kind of that diversity of attitudes, beliefs, and values. So there are many programs and office in the organization now that are moving towards a career ladder interdisciplinary scientist positions. Um, we have found, especially in the Division of Environmental Assessment, that by focusing on people that have interdisciplinary science backgrounds working in multiple disciplines, that they actually have, they've, they're better at responding to a lot of the needs across our programs and different scientific areas that we need to evaluate and we need to, you know, develop science around. And so it's very helpful, uh, as well as in the hiring process too, because the hiring process can be very long and lengthy in the federal government. And so by using these types of interdisciplinary scientist positions and broad job, broad job announcements, um, we really focus in attracting early career individuals with diverse backgrounds. Um, and we also have to keep things fair and transparent and to limit bias in the hiring process. We're developing structured panel interview processes. And we're also looking at additional um, hiring avenues, including uh, the Canals Fellows and ORISE, which is um, science fellowships from the Oak Ridge Institute for Science and Education. And we're hoping that we're once we get the ORISE um, vehicles in place to, to partner with them on that, um, we're hoping to focus to start using that to potentially bring on students from historically underrepresented communities to help us work and gain experience in the federal workforce. Next slide. So moving on away from the cross-cutting attributes and more into the process phase attributes, you can see here that there are four identified and we'll go through those one-on-one. -on -one. And I'm gonna talk about these mainly in the context of our annual studies development process. Next slide. The first attribute, attribute clearly identifies science needs. So, you know, looking at the annual studies development process, it's, it's done within the context of the studies program strategic framework and this, you know, outward looking um, forward analysis that was done for the decadal vision. Um, traditionally, a lot of our identification of science needs, we have reached out to stakeholders to provide input, but a lot of our studies ideas have been developed mainly from the bottom up. In the last few years, we have been um, working with leadership to have additional input at the beginning of the studies price process by clearly articulating administration priorities and then how those priorities fall into the work that OEM does. So you can look here at the examples that we've identified or John Lilly has identified. So the administration priorities, they're four identified here, climate change, fish and fisheries, tribal um, and environmental justice. And there's in the next studies development cycle or the one we're currently going through uh, fiscal years 24 and 25, you can see the numbers of studies that are in that. We also reach out to stakeholders, a wide range of stakeholders and partners for input at the beginning of our study development plan cycle. And here are some numbers that look at um, how that, that input that we get from federal partners and external stakeholders. And then of course the region and programs 
uh, prioritize studies according to their need once studies are developed. Next slide. So the next process phase attribute is appraises and translate, translates research needs. So BOEM's subject matter experts review all the received um, studies development process stakeholder input. Um, they also work across the Bureau to develop draft study profiles based on internal need, continuation of prior work or input for partners and stakeholders. And they also have incorporated a structured framework, the Peacock Framework Population Intervention Comparison Outcome Context for profile development. And then we do go through an internally peer reviewed process um, through what we call science and technical review teams. And then for the funded studies, the SMEs develop um, in conjunction with our, our procurement office uh, requests for proposals. We evaluate the program proposals using technical evaluation committees, and then often served as contracting officer representatives through study completion. Next slide. Again, we've made some, um, some advances in looking at ways within our own internal processes and using additional um, vehicles to encourage invest diverse investigators. So as you can see here, again, this kind of gets into the systems work, but DOI issued final by Indian Act implement, implementing rule. And this helped eliminate restrictions, expanded ability and granted preferences and harmonized reg regulations within HHS, Health and Human Services. But it also provided clarity on how other agencies could use this act to help um, to provide the ability to contract, you know, to Native American or Indian Native American Indian um, companies. Next slide. And again, as mentioned previously, we now have access to being able to partner directly with tribal nations using the Take Pride in American Act, and this is through. Um, cooperative agreements and the assistance can be used to conduct public awareness related to environmental and cultural research within BOEM's environmental research portfolio. We are also looking at how to advance educational equity, excellence, and economic opportunity through historically black colleges and universities. And this is was articulated in executive order 14041. So we are continuing to look at how to partner with and you know contract with both uh, tribal nations as well as historically underrepresented communities. Next slide. And this slide illustrates that several of the procurement considerations to remove barriers. We do include evaluation. So we're looking at um, in proposing to include evaluation criteria, criteria within contracts or cooperative agreement announcements that encourage applicants to partner with small disadvantaged businesses and underserved communities. And within our own procurement systems, um, our grant solution systems, we are looking at when we develop open funding announcements that we are making sure that they are, go out to the widest possible audiences. Next slide. Monitor study proce progress. Um, this is another process phase attributes that um, we have been working on. And a lot of this is not simply just monitoring, you know, the, the quality of the, the study pro products or the timeliness of them. That's an aspect of it. But this process attribute really gets into kind of the continuous monitoring of the studies themselves and their deliverables and how input is received during those studies and how information is shared among principal investigators for studies. So I'll provide a couple of different examples of that and how we've done that in the past and, and how we've kind of reinvigorated that. But just to point out that Boehm held the 28th information transfer meeting um, in September of last year. Now, 
these information transfer meetings are really a way that um, on a regional basis that scientists can, that are involved in environmental studies program could get together at an annual meeting, um, foster the sharing of results, methodologies, and ideas related to environmental studies. So scientists in these meetings present, discuss, and share their findings in support of the regional um, program offices. And, and it's really interesting because the one that, the last one we had before this was in 2017. And I know that when I started at, you know, MMS back before it became BOEM, you know, having these meetings was a pretty regular occurrence. And it was great because you can get the science staff along with the scientists that are conducting the studies to do these presentations and you can have this cross pollination, right? But that has been hampered quite honestly by uh, increased oversight and spending on the, and the ability to have these types of meetings. And then of course the COVID pandemic exasperated that by not having those meetings. And you can have these in a virtual way, but it is much more meaningful from a networking perspective to actually have people physically present. Um, we also do do a lot of work in within studies deliverables themselves in looking at how do we how do we focus the methodologies and the work that is proposed in the study. And a lot of times that's easier to do with cooperative agreements because they're more flexible than contract vehicles. But one of the studies, uh, the image in this is actually from the paleocultural landscape study. Um, and this is at the initial project workshop. At the end of that workshop, this is uh, everybody that was involved in that workshop was um, participating in a Native American traditional prayer cycle. And this, this study, um, we intentionally put this as part of the study because we wanted to work with tribal nations, academic partners, um, state and federal agencies to really help us frame the methodologies and scope of the work of this study. Um, and it was a really, really fantastic process to sit there in a, in a three day kind of meeting workshop to actually have those conversations that helped frame um, the rest of the work for that study. So these are types of examples of how um, the Bureau um, works to um, ensure that funded projects that um, are aware of relevant research um, that is ongoing within BOEM and externally. Um, and and really how to you know, really focus to make sure that the study deliverables and the methodology are gonna meet the specified need of the study. Next slide. So now I'm gonna move on to the output phase attributes. And you can see there's three of them here um, summarized as ensures product quality, encourages tailored products and synthesizes scientific findings. Next slide. So ensuring the quality, this is tied in also with the studies development product um, and process, um, the annual studies development plan process. And it ties into ensuring quality is we have a lot of internal science and technical peer review. And a lot of this, this peer review process um, is based on the Office of Management and Budgets 2002 guidelines for influential and highly influential studies as well as our own planning process and strategic framework. We um, do have the ability for highly influential and influential studies and a requirement to look at how we're going to have external review for those processes. And I know that BOEM has used the National Academy of Sciences in the past to review um, particularly one study that was deemed highly influential. Um, and there is a, um, BOEM does publish its guidelines for their BOEM's quality of information peer review on its website. We're also working to develop new guidance for the acceptance of deliverables. And this really works with the COR, which is almost exclusively a subject matter expert that is uh, providing that um, contracting, that representation to the contractor op contracting officer, but the COR and the environmental studies program representative 
ensure that they review all the comments, that all the comments during the review process are addressed by the principal investigator, or at least it's stated why um, they are not being addressed. Um, the environmental studies program representative must concur that all the scientific and technical issues have been addressed. The copy of the final report, including reviewer comments and responses is kept on file. There is a resolution process if any outstanding disagreements between the COR and the environmental studies program representative. Um, and then we have an additional step that the actual reports and products that are developed through our studies program are not to be published on a BOEM webpage released to the public until they've been accepted by the environmental studies program chief. Next slide. Again, quality. Um, we also look at the environmental studies program assessment tool. So this is a way to basically assess, did the study, was the study timely, was the quality of the materials developed adequate um, and, and an assessment on was, did it meet the needs of the study um, and, and those types of elements. Uh, so, and did the study have peer review? So, and the time and budget. So you can see the four key elements right there. Next slide. Tailored products. So this is really um, encourages or develops an array of outputs and communication strategies for a study tailored to specific uses by broad and varied audiences. And this is very important. And most of you that were involved in the COSA meeting yesterday saw some examples of tailored products that are being developed. But many studies um, have these tailored products as specific deliverables written into the contracts or cooperative agreements. And then products are also created by support contracts at the directions of our scientists and communications team. So examples are documentaries, story maps, ArcGIS story maps, videos. You saw an example, uh, the frequency image here is from the, uh, the, the animated video that uh, Erica presented yesterday. And we also do whiteboard animations explaining our process and programs. And these are really valuable for um, kind of breaking down the information and often large study reports into accessible uh, media. Um, we also, BOEM has put in place and um, hired a science communication and outreach liaison. Um, that's Jen Ewald in our environmental studies program. And so she is instrumental in working with uh, across the Bureau and with our Office of Communications to develop um, help us um, think about what tailored products and how to get that information out to broader audiences. Um, next slide. So this is kind of a combination of how we synthesize information at the Bureau as well, well as tailored outputs. Um, so it also it also pertains to the impact attribute three, which we'll talk about in a little bit on influences public understanding. So these are examples of our oceans, ocean science, uh, the ocean science magazine. Now it's been called different things in the past, but ocean science is the science and technology journal, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. And this journal was conceived, created, and led by the Gulf of Mexico region with input from the Office of Environmental Programs, the Office of Communication, and subject matter experts throughout the Bureau. These issues are organized thematically. Um, and so you can see here some representative uh, samples of looking at field work, uh, social science, economic um, issues, and preservation of past culture. Um, and they're done in a really accessible format. But we've looked at with the coming of, I guess, the lessening of the utility of publishing print medium and moving more to social media and electronic versions. Um, the Bureau in 2021 really looked at how we can reimagine how we are getting uh, BOEM's ocean science out to a wider audi audience. So the management and production activities for ocean science were transferred to the Office of Communications in 2021. And it resulted in an effort to reimagine and rebrand the journal. 
And what came out of this is that the Bureau launched its own ocean science news in March, 2022. So with the, you know, trying to be brief, timely um, online and have summaries of the, the most pertinent research that's going on at the time. And then transferred the ocean science from a magazine format to an ongoing exclusively online platform in this year. So with longer, more in-depth articles produced on a monthly or bi-monthly basis. So we're hoping that um, we're hoping that this change will improve our ability to produce timely and relevant stories on BOEM scientific efforts, adjust to the shifting trend from print to digital media, and increase our ability to reach broader audiences and coordinate amplification across social media platforms. Next slide. So, okay, thank you. Um, another type of synthesis is driven by our um, Office of Renewable Energy Programs, and they are they have produced the Atlantic Science in Review Year in Review, which presents studies completed. This one example is 2021. Um, the studies are in support of our BOEM's Offshore Renewable Energy Program along the Atlantic coast. And as you can see here, each featured study has an overview, summary of key findings, synopsis of how BOEM will use the information, and links to additional information related to the study. Next slide. Another example is Environmental Studies Program Quarterly Reports, which includes summaries of the BOEM environmental studies completed each quarter. Again, they include synopses of funding information, purpose and information use, and key findings and results. The information is sent out to a list of science stakeholders, um, and BOEM manages that list for distribution of studies materials and for solicitation of study ideas at the beginning of each annual study development planning cycle. These are also found on our website. Next slide. Moving on to the impact phase attributes, there's three of these. Um, influent, informs and influences users, advances the state of science and influences public understanding. Um, I'm gonna talk about these with the, in the context are of our evaluating connections project. And this has been an ongoing project from 2019 to the present. Um, so it's really conducting an evaluation to understand how Environmental Studies Program funded research contributes to BOEM's assessments and vice versa, and really looks at study results, how they're incorporated into assessments, um, how information needs are identified through the assessment process, and how studies and assessments are informing policy decisions. The internal evaluation was executed in spring of 2021, and the final report was completed in December 2021. The external evaluation um, began in September 2021 with the final report anticipated in spring 2023. Apologies for the typo there. Um, so this external um, element of the report is gonna focus on evaluating the external influence of BOEM science and assessments. And the methodology includes interviews, surveys, and a social network analysis. So we affectionately call this the feedback loop. So it's really trying to get at you know, the kind of loop, internal loop, and then of how assessments inform studies and studies get incorporated into assessments as well as the external influence. And so you'll see that this is relevant to a lot of the eva sample evaluating questions uh, pointed to in the first in class report. Next slide. So some of the uh, key um, elements here, you can see the next steps and actions table. And again, this is available on our website. Um, and one of those things is the, you know, hire, one of the um, recommendations was to hire a science communication liaison. Um, and that we have done. And so there is synergy between a lot of the recommendations, both internally and externally um, on this. And so we are looking at how to implement this. And now we're looking at how that fits in with some of the evaluation um, questions identified in the first in class report. Next slide. 
this is one thing, one of the recommendations that we are evaluating currently. We have not got a lot of traction on with some of the other work that we're doing, but I just wanted you to be aware that there is this recommendation to develop a cross region and program working group to consider establishing a tracking system for information needs. And so I think that that will meet several of the uh, evaluating criteria. So we'll look at how that fits in with that, um, those recommendations from um, the ad hoc committee. Next slide. Uh, again, enhanced functionality, ESPIS database. Um, this has been a struggle um, lately. Um, we have now shifted um, a lot of our studies de deliverables to the government publishing office website as a, a near-term solution while we reevaluate how to internally um, reimagine the environmental studies program information system database and how we're gonna manage that internally. Uh, previously, we had worked um, with NOAA to actually house and maintain that database and that is no longer feasible. And so now we're assessing how we're going to work internally um, to do that. Um, we have developed um, internally some uh, environmental studies theme pages that aggregate and synthesize some of the studies information and point to the relevant studies. We are also um, in the process, we've got the framework of an internal status of the OCS web portal um, that has been developed and there are some sample topical area landing pages for environmental justice is one example of those as well as uploading a lot of our um, BOEM assessment documents and white papers and we are working on ensuring that there is a robust connection between the status of the OCS web portal and the studies deliverables and so what we're hoping is that internally, at least immediately, and then in the future, we're hoping to have an external version of the status of the OCS web portal. It's allow us to search across our assessment and studies information and bring those in quickly, as well as having some uh, synthesized information from these reports on the state of knowledge within particular topical areas or addressing complex issues. So that's our vision for the future. Um, we are now working on developing the backbone for that. And then we're also looking at bringing on ORISE fellows to gain experience and helping with the uploading and synthesizing of that information. Next slide. Okay, innovation phase. So there are three key attributes in the innovation phase, um, basically where seeks opportunities for innovation, adapts to new challenges and implements an innovation strategy. Um, to give a little bit of background on uh, innovation within BOEM, it's something that we have been thinking about. We have been doing um, on kind of an ad hoc study by study basis. But we really dug into this starting in 2020 um, with the, developing a strategy for emerging technology, followed by 2021, um, the Div Division of Environmental Sciences within Office Environmental Programs developed a tiger team looking at, you know, putting together a strategy for successful innovation. As part of that, it's identify and research new technologies, priorities, and challenges. Um, develop and test viability of potential opportunities with pilot projects, focus on disseminating results across BOEM, and implement new technologies and approaches where relevant, and adapt and refine as needed. We've also experimented and with some success looking at prize challenges, and here's a couple of them. So BOEM partners with NASA's Center for Excellence and Collaborative Innovation to implement more of these crowdsourcing or citizen science challenges. Um, you can see that there's a couple here. Where's Whale Do? If you think about the, the, kids, the kids book, Where's Waldo? It's kind of a play on that. Um, but these are types of things that we're looking at. Um, you know, that one is focusing on crowdsourcing challenge to help researchers accurately identify endangered Cook Inlet beluga whale individuals from photos and result, uh, wanted to result in an automated solution so that we can 
integrate an algorithm, yeah, algorithm into the existing Flukebook open, open source program. And Jake Levison can provide more information on that if he's on the line, if we have time to discuss. Next slide. But the exciting part of the innovation attributes one is really that we're, the Bureau is moving forward with recruitment of a position to be our lead in innovation with the charge to lay the groundwork for what were a proposed center for innovative ocean monitoring that we're hoping to stand up in, in the new year, in the next few years. So the innovation attribute seeks opportunities for innovation. The director is gonna be responsible for developing a strategic plan, including partners process outreach, and then building out uh, ocean monitoring analysis for decision support integration across cross partners. And adapting to new challenges, you know, commute, communicate innovation needs and challenges throughout the Bureau and to external partners to encourage innovation and institutionalize in the environmental studies program planning process. And then again, what's key to that is implementing an innovation strategy. So develop and execute workforce plan um, to help accelerate innovation, um, develop a cost sharing mechanisms and public access to the data. Next slide. That is the bulk of the presentation. So thanks for staying with me. I know there's a lot of information here. I have highlighted a couple of key um, things to help engender further discussion on some of the evaluating connections. Um, but really, you know, looking at the strategic partnership piece is, is going to be key. As I mentioned, really, how do we dig in on the cost benefit analysis and then develop you know, assessment and evaluation metrics for this piece. Um, this is especially true with a small organization like BOEM. Um, again, some other things that are encompassed in these evaluating questions are how to develop a flexible strategic study process that recognizes changing administration needs as well as um, identified stakeholder and science needs. I, I have looked at Shell's scenario planning process um, and I believe Scott and some others on COSA are experienced in utilizing that process, but I think that's something that um, I am interested in exploring because it helps us frame uh, the future challenges and then starting how to build on some of the commonalities that may exist between those challenges. Um, and again, you know, how do we do this evaluation work you know, <laughs> on the fly while we're still funding, managing, and utilizing existing and future studies? And so these are some of the things, and I know that there's been some uh, input in the chat, but with that, I will put myself back on screen and uh, open it up. I know it's a lot of information, and I thank you for staying with me through that. Stacy, I can't hear you. I don't know if that's just me. No, it's not just you. It's me. I apologize. <laughs> um, but no, I, I just wanted to, to thank you, Brian, for that presentation. I know that the COSA members were really eager to get the update, um, and it was uh, clearly a very thoughtful presentation. Um, as we wait for folks to raise hands, and I know, um, as you mentioned, Les had put a question into the comment, but I just wanted to make um, two quick points. One is just a quick clarification particularly for our new COSA members and anybody on the line that isn't familiar with the um, with, uh, COSA and our process. Uh, you had mentioned the um, various stages of your studies development process, including um, on your slide, it said National Academy of Sciences Review. And I just wanted to draw the distinction um, between the formal reviews that we have done um, that the you know, National Academies has convened consensus uh, bodies, uh, committees to do separate reviews of individual project, projects for BOEM, um, which is different than what COSA does in their annual consideration of the studies development plan. And I just wanted to make that point real clear because I know um, we use the term review in very particular ways. Um, and so uh, what we do in the, in the summer months uh, is not considered a review, um, but, but we have done consensus reviews of bone projects before. So I wanted to make that point clear. 
I also really wanted to highlight, um, especially because um, it's been some time since COSA has had a meeting or um, topic focused on that feedback loop that you were discussing. But that is something that uh, COSA in the past has spent a fair amount of time thinking about the relationship between the science and the assessments and how those inform each other. And I was thrilled to see that highlighted in your presentation, Brian. So um, again, just wanting to sort of point that out, particularly for our newer members. Um, and also, Brian, to thank you for highlighting that, um, because I know that that's uh, certainly been of interest of uh, an interest of COSA in the past. So with that, I'll look for um, some raised hands and maybe uh, Les, if you're available, we can start with you since you put a question in the comments. I will also ask you just to introduce yourself briefly. Um, we sped through the committee introductions pretty quickly this morning. So we'll start with you and then we'll go to Scott. Thanks, Stacy. Uh, I'm Les Kaufman. I'm a professor of marine biology at Boston University, and I've been a COSA member, I think, for coming on a year. I don't know. It time goes by so quickly when you're having time. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> I have some familiarity with BOEM and working with BOEM. And uh, Brian, uh, you've done a really great job describing the process for best in class, which I think is one of the most exciting things I've heard about going on at BOEM. But there hasn't, we haven't had a chance to hear much about the outcomes, the vision, how BOEM would look different, how it would be more nimble, how it would be able to do innovative things. Uh, my understanding right now is that one of the things hampering innovation and risk at BOEM is that where kind of Bohm showed us short staffed. And a lot of the times the same people are the taskmaster and the slave. I don't mean slave, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yes, I know. I Wearing it, multiple like, hats, it, multiple it, hats. It, yeah, but those are two hats that like, one's on the head and I won't say where the other one goes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I hear your comment. Is there a specific question? <laughs> yeah, the question is, if you look at the structure of BOEM right now, it's not, mm -hmm. it's, not in, it's not like really encouraging that it's set up for innovation. Even though I know mm -hmm. from knowing so many people in BOEM now that that's really what people are excited about and are ready to take off on. What yeah. can we do to make BOEM to make BOEM work less as a contracting agency and more as an innovator? No, I think that's a great question, Les. And I know Brad's on. I will just say that it's it's not going to be an easy or quick solution. <laughs> so as we know, I mean, a lot of these things are, you know, anytime you talk about change. And that order of magnitude, it doesn't happen overnight. You know, a lot of this stuff can take many years, right? So I think one of the things is really important is creating that innovation vision, innovative vision. Where does BOEM see itself? What does that look like in the future? And then step back in the kind of the zoom out, zoom in principles and really start focusing on what concrete steps are within our control now and then develop kind of a strategy for getting there while looking for opportunities, you know, especially for, you know, maybe being, being disruptive or where other people are being disruptive and how can you partner with those individuals to really move things forward. I think that's key, but without having that vision and knowing where you're going and what that success looks like, mm. you could spend a lot of time, wasted time and effort trying to do things that you don't really have a chance in doing because you're just not set up for it, like you pointed out. So it's, it's, a, big, it's a big ask, it's bold, which I think is what really excites people. But it, the important thing about the vision and having that strategic framework is it helps you keep centered on getting there 
and not losing track and going down all the rabbit holes that <laughs> you know you can go down all of this stuff but it also goes into one of the questions i i threw out there because i think it's really important is how do we become really strategic and looking at partnerships across the board and how do you evaluate cost benefit analysis and time and resources in actually developing those partnerships and feeding those partnerships long term because we don't have all the answers most agencies don't have the answers but there is potential that if we all work together you know to a common purpose not on everything but on key issues that the we have a better success of doing it because different agencies have different statutory funding vehicles um i'll stop there and let brad jump in i know he's visible but, but thanks for the question it's really important yeah yeah thanks les <clears throat> yeah I, th I mean i think it's it's always a balancing act and i think the place where where bohm can sort of step more into that that realm of that that higher risk uh you know high risk high reward uh world is is in the studies program Right. And I think we're, we're starting to see that more. We've had a lot more focused conversations over the last probably two study cycles about how much risk are we willing to add into our portfolio for projects that might not work or projects, you know, developing new technology that might not, you know, might not come to fruition, might not be able to be implemented. Um, and I think we're seeing that that slowly increase right because at the end of the day we do have to balance the fact that we are also a regulatory agency and our folks doing our consultations writing our eis's you know they, they need certain information they need it updated on a certain frequency uh you know we move into new areas we need new information we need baseline information so so you know balancing that the core science mission to support the operational needs versus the risk um that is, I mean, that is a discussion we sort of have to have every year. I think the and Rodney can talk about this if you know if he wants to as well. The the new center for uh, innovative ocean monitoring that we're trying to set up, we do have you know approval for the the head of that uh, of that team or officer that ends up being, uh, and that would be sort of that that person whose job it is to think strategically about all right, what does the agency need in terms of innovation? How can I you know how can that person go out there look at what's going on? Uh, out in the research space, out you know, outside of the agency, and see what folks are doing, see what technologies are being developed, what people are thinking about, and taking that back to our folks, and also working with our folks and saying, all right, well, what do you guys need? What technology don't you have? You know, like what are our what are your big bottlenecks? How can we maybe solve that with a new technology, with a new process, and bring that back out, you know, to industry, to academia? So I think we are trying to to do that, um, but right with a limited budget. And with you know a certain large percentage of what we do, like we have to have results, we have to have data, we have to have information. Um, so it is a balancing act. But I think that the studies program and OEP is really the place where where we have that freedom to be able to do that because we are somewhat set apart from the operational side of of the agency. Um, it's not going to be everything, but it's going to be a lot more than than other offices are able to do. And we're trying to to. To expand that and Rodney, I'll let Rodney uh, chime in as well. Well, thanks, Brad. I, I agree with everything you said. So uh, <laughs> I guess we can build on that a, a little bit. But I mean, it really started several years ago with our strategy for emerging technology and realizing the, the need for innovation in, in the environmental studies program and the need to, uh, to build something um, this center, Center for Innovative Ocean Monitoring, that 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 could set in the environmental program, but touch um, you know all of our scientists, no matter what discipline, you know, no matter if you're studying acoustics or you're studying birds or you're a social scientist, you know, the Center for Innovative Ocean Mon Monitoring can help advise and touch uh, any of those individuals throughout all those disciplines to use the best technologies and techniques moving forward. We, we know our responsibilities are huge and they just keep building and building and building. We know we're going to have to do more monitoring out there as activity continues, especially with uh, with offshore wind. Um, and, you know, the territories are a new challenge uh, as well as is, as is carbon sequestration, critical minerals, and the continuation of conventional energy. So these things are going to just keep going. So we're really looking at a way 
to address these needs the best way we can uh, through innovation. Um, but I have to remind everybody too, you know, remember, remember we don't have any ships or satellites or uh, AUVs or anything. So uh, any, any study we do, uh, if we're looking at- We have, uh, we have one glider. Well, we have one glider. <laughs> uh, most studies we do, it's a little one glider. Uh, it's a most start. Studies we, we do our, our partnerships, right? I mean, you know, how do we actually do animal telemetry, you know, without NASA satellites? We can't. You know, we are utilizing the International Space Station. You know, those, those, these are innovative, innovative techniques that we're trying to use to really do a better job in, in monitoring the environment. Um, so our, our partnerships are critical to our success as it is right now. Um, you know, could we be more strategic? Probably, uh, but uh, uh, at, at the same time, um, you know, those different mandates that uh, all the agencies have we have to really spend time looking for that alignment. Uh, and that can be complicated. Yeah. Um, you know, just, just working with Navy, who do you talk to and when, and when is their budget going to come along? <clears throat> we leveraged almost 20 million with DOE last year. Uh, that, that, that was huge. Uh, but again, it takes a lot of work getting, getting to that point. And it's not something you can do every, every year, but it yeah. is, you know, it, it does have to be strategic and we really encourage, encourage our folks to do that. But, yeah, and I think just on the on the strategic piece, because Brian touched on that, and and Rodney touched on it as well, and then I'll I'll shut up and let Scott talk. Um, I think we are trying to be more, definitely trying to be more strategic in, in how we're reaching out to folks and how we're doing more long term planning. Right. So last year we got uh, authority for uh, the territories uh, for certain activities. You know, immediately we reached out to NOAA and COS to try to start working with them, building that partnership, understanding what work they've already been doing, what partners they've been working with on the ground in those areas. Um, and that's something that that's already bearing fruit, right? They actually have money this year to do some of that foundational work in Puerto Rico uh, and the Virgin Islands. And, you know, working with them, you know, we're helping them develop sort of what the priorities and those questions are, but they're going to go out and they're going to undertake that in partnership with us, but with their funding, right, this year. So, so these things are already starting. Um, we have uh, over the last probably 18 months, uh, we've really reinvigorated our conversations with uh, DOE and uh, PNNL specifically. Uh, and a lot of it is on sort of the innovation uh, aspect. They're, they have a lot of folks uh, out there, uh, out in SQUIM in particular, really working on some of these innovative techniques, particularly on the tagging side, uh, looking at uh, innovative ocean monitoring type things that they're doing out there, uh, you know, off their dock. And really connecting our staff with their staff, identifying early on potential contract vehicles, ways that we can work directly with, with their staff. Cause it's a little complicated with some of these, these folks, cause they're not all necessarily uh, feds or contractors sometimes. Um, so we are really looking at those things in a more strategic fashion, uh, but we are, I mean, reality is sometimes we are hamstrung by funding cycles, funding types at other agencies. You know, it's just, sometimes things don't work out and they have to be a little more ad hoc and it is us coming and saying hey we have a million dollars for this what can you contribute um so it is it is something we are we are thinking about and i think brian's absolutely right we need to continue to be moving more toward that strategic thing but i i don't think we can ignore those ad hoc opportunities either so i'll i'll stop there brad Real quick, before I call on you, Scott, um, just because uh, we do have new members on the line and also um, we've got 77 participants total, I think it might be helpful, um, Rodney and Brad, if you could each just introduce yourselves as well, um, since I'm not sure everybody on the line will necessarily know who you are. So, uh, Brad, maybe I can have you go first and then Rodney, and then we'll turn to Scott. Yeah, you did ask us to do that, didn't you? Sorry. Uh, so I'm, I'm Brad Blythe. I am chief of the branch of biological and social sciences. Uh, so working under Rodney, help administer the environment studies program. I'm also BOEM scientific integrity officer. Sorry, Stacey, I will introduce myself now. Thanks. I'm Rodney <laughs> Cluck. Uh, I'm chief of uh, the Division of Environmental Sciences under the Office of Environmental Programs, and I'm also the chief of BOEM's environmental studies program. All right, Scott, can you next? So uh, I want to thank Brian for uh, uh, giving us this update. This was very, very interesting to see where where, where you've gone with the first in class class report, and uh, uh, 
uh, I look forward to also seeing the slide deck, uh, getting the slide deck, to take a closer look at it. Uh, looks like a fairly uh, a, um, strong effort to try to move it along here. Uh, I think you asked for um, specific feedback from COSA, at least in, in, in one key area early on, and it's one of the um, cross-cutting attributes, which is you know guidance we might have relative to strategic partnerships, and that's come up again in the, discuss in the discussions we've ju just had about some of the new initiatives. I, my, uh, that's something we can certainly look, look to and, and, and try to develop for you. I mean, what, one quick thought I have is indeed, you know, as, as Rodney has said, you don't have as much resource, you don't have your own fleet, uh, uh, you know, partnering up with others is absolutely crucial for, for you to achieve your mission. And I'm, and I'm wondering if one area uh, or a couple areas to really focus on are some of these new challenges you face, new domains that you're entering into. So it would be see, uh, uh, offshore carbon capture and storage. That might be one. Uh, Brad, uh, you, I think you mentioned uh, uh, the, um, uh, the territories. That's another. Uh, if we get into critical minerals and some new, in, in new arenas, that's, that's yet another. Uh, but, but just you know, get 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 after it right from the get go. As you as you're entering into these areas, start to build those partnerships right now, so they become integral. And mm -hmm. and I think the uh, you know as you set up your your center for innovative ocean monitoring, you might have some built in partners already uh, coming out of that uh, uh, study on priorities for the EEZ that came out of the White House, the uh, NOMAC or whatever it was called, but. Um, uh, look like a lot of commonality of interest between the agencies uh, uh, there, and, and there may be some 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 opportunities. Um, the other thing that was a uh, besides partnerships is sort of a cross cutting cross cutting after my mind, but also a, a kind of a big picture thing for first in class to to be first in class. Uh, uh, you know, you're going to have to, somebody's got to measure that you're first, huh? <laughs> and, and, and you, and you kind of, you kind of talked a little bit about that. And I, and I think we kept coming back to it, uh, in the report, uh, when you talked about the, um, the output, uh, uh, process attributes, you mentioned the looking into the quality of, of, of the outputs, uh, you mentioned the ESP PAT tool that you have. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I think some kind of, uh, maybe spending a little more time at some point getting an update on how you're measuring that stuff looking back on how that's uh that is being done it would would be useful you, it also came up again uh in the impact phase when you talked about um kind of going to the the uh the external review phase of uh the uh, evaluating connections study now as i recall evaluating connections was underway when we did First in class is that not, isn't that right? It was kind of a pair. They were going on at the same time, and uh, yeah, so, it's exactly yeah. And and so then you got then you got first in class, and 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 I have to of course di digest that. Um, <laughs> I I, I it's, it I'm just kind of it looked like it was like you're kind of 18 months into the external review phase of yeah. of uh, evaluating connections. That seems a little long. So uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm hopeful we can hear more on on that. Yeah progress on that before too long because that that's mighty important to being able to measure uh yes yeah and we expect to get that report um shortly the the okay. draft report for that so i know that okay. it has been these things have taken time <laughs> so um yeah we're looking forward to getting that also but yeah i think you're absolutely right um you know first we have to understand you know the complexity you know that i pointed out and then what are we, which of these sample evaluation questions do we want to really focus on? You know, because there's like 76 of them. So, yeah. Well, <laughs> so well, yeah. At, at the end, at the end of the day, I mean, uh, uh, yeah. you know, Rodney, you look after the environmental studies program uh, mm -hmm. and, 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 and uh, uh, of course we have the assessment program. We, we need to see how they link up together to, uh, you know, achieve yeah. BOEM's objectives. And that's, and that's really what this 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 whole that whole bit is all about is really making sure that mm -hmm. you're getting that feedback loop that Stacy talked about, um, and that's been a consistent um, you know theme of inquiry by COSA over the years is is trying to probe you a little bit on that one. So please keep after it, and and we look forward to a, a further update on on where you stand on that. That's 
but yeah. th thanks for the update. It was it's uh, good to see you're making progress. I look forward to seeing the slide pack. All right, thanks, Scott. Yes, thank you, Scott. Any other uh, questions, thoughts, feedback? Looking for some hands. Rod, and then Jack. All right. So, um, thanks, Brian. Um, that was very informative. Um, I was going to wait to ask my question, but as there was a pause, I'm going to ask it now. So um, when the first in class report came out, I was politely critical of it. Um, and the reason that I was a little bit critical of it because was because there was very little mention of cultural resources in it. So the examples were all from natural resources. Um, there were the National Historic Preservation Act, the legis legislation was not included. And mentioned in it and the comparisons were um, mostly to do with natural resources the national park service as a comparative agency wasn't included and then of course once i um paused a little bit and thought about it um a little bit more um i thought that the systems approach did apply uh, across the agency um across uh, sorry across the bureau um so that um you know the cross-cutting attributes and the process phase, output, input phase, and innovation uh, attributes all, all applied to both natural and cultural resources. So my question to you, Brian, is, and you're probably uniquely positioned perhaps to answer this, is, um, is do you think anything was lost by perhaps not further consideration of cultural resources in the first in class report? Uh, or do you think that um, the systems approach um, applies um, broadly across the Bureau and the value of the first in class report um, is, is, is applicable in both of those contexts. Yeah, thanks, Rod. Um, I do think there's a challenge in the first in class, anytime you're looking at developing kind of broad scale attributes and, and covering, you know, all the different you know, individual disciplines or, you know, ways of, you know, how we explore science and, and other, other information that is not scientific, you know, or we wouldn't consider using the scientific process, so to speak. Um, how, do, how do you capture that? So I think that the, the systems approach is very valuable as a framework for looking at that, because as you know, you know, cultural and natural are in some ways, artificial subdivisions, especially among many groups where they don't see a difference between cultural heritage and, you know, the natural world in that intersection. So I do think, you know, that the systems framework is applicable across the disciplines. And where we work at BOEM, we are constantly looking at how to, you know, integrate. And when we develop studies is to get the most value from those studies. You know, one of the examples, if you want to look at from an archaeological perspective, is you look at some of the, the Lophelia studies on deep water wrecks in the Gulf of Mexico. Now that afforded us to use, you know, very expensive ship time to actually develop studies and scientific questions that address multiple disciplines. And it also, you know, allowed people to understand that there's a starting point for coral succession because we have a timestamp on when a ship went down. And so there's a lot of advantages for approaching that way. And I think our Bureau has shown that we've been able to do that. And a lot of it's by necessity because these studies can be extremely expensive. And so you have to maximize, you know, the amount of information that you gather from that. Um, the other thing that I know is because it may be it gets overlooked, especially in the archaeological, is because Bohm has a competency, a core competency in marine archaeology within its bureau. It's the only federal agency that I know of that actually has any guidelines for requirements of doing paleocultural landscape reconstruction from survey data across the board. And this is something that we've been building on for 40 years. And as an example of how we use studies information to inform policy, um, if you're not familiar, there's a notice for proposed rulemaking on 
um, our marine archaeology rule uh, for the um, language within our regulations, updating that for the oil and gas program right now. Now that language and, and the reason why we're going through that update is directly relevant to the amount of information and studies that we've funded over the years, showing that a potential archeological resource like a shipwreck could be found anywhere in the OCS. And so that's a direct kind of connection and it falls into those evaluation, you know, evaluation question metrics is how are studies being used to influence policy and how is that being called out? So if you look at that rule, uh, the proposed rulemaking, you will actually see many of the studies that we have funded called out specifically as evidence for why that rule needs to be updated. So, it's, you know, it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? Because it's like the squeaky wheel gets the sword. So it's not really the shipwreck side of things that we're focusing on now. It's more the more challenging thing is how do you actually find you know, potential Native American sites on the OCS. And that's a whole order of magnitude more challenging than the shipwreck question. Now, I think we have good processes in place and requirements for um, surveys before activities are allowed to occur for shipwrecks. But now the next step, and we've done some work on this, but there's a lot more going on and a lot more working with our tribal nation partners to actually develop how would you actually, you know, go about locating a site? I mean, it's challenging enough to develop, a, you know, a paleo landform or to identify one and then develop paleoecological, you know, reconstruction of that landform and then to find a site on that or avoid a site. It's challenging. And that's kind of the next area where I think it's, you know, we're going to have to focus on more, but there are a lot of technological limitations to doing that research. And so that's another area where maybe innovation can be applied and looking across you know, different disciplines for how they're identifying things could shed light on that. So, but thank you. Thank you, that's, that's very useful. And in fact, um, um, you know, the consideration of the new rule and the uh, paleoarchaeological landscape reconstruction, I thought that some of those examples, those kinds of examples would have been um, uh, very um, useful in the first in class report. But anyway, I know that the bureaus has uh, has substantial expertise in marine archaeology. Um, uh, and many, many of us are envious of the expertise that you have in, in, <laughs> in that world. Yeah. But anyway, thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you, Rob. Yeah. And Jack, I'm going to hold up just for a moment because I suspect that Hillary's hand is raised also in response to Rob's question. So Hillary, if I could just ask you to introduce yourself as well. Um, and go ahead and provide your response. Sure. Hi, Rod. My name is Hillary Rennick, and I'm the Tribal Liaison Officer for the Bureau. And I just wanted to address your, your question really quick. And, and so for the folks on, and so in my experience that um, the first in class report has elevated, um, you know, tribal um, knowledge you know, just to the bureau level and has helped legitimize tribal science and technology where a lot of folks, um, you know, just have not historically um, seen tribal science as a legitimate science. And so at least for me, just having this forum where um, bringing, you know, folks that are tribal members themselves as scientists taking tribal knowledge and incorporate it into our documents and putting it in a form where it's actually respected and valued has been really important. And, and for myself too, as a tribal member myself. So, um, and I think it has elevated the relationship um, that BOEM has had, has had and, and is having with tribal nations. So um, I don't know if you have any other questions. No, thank you. That's, that's very encouraging. Thank you. Thank you, Hillary. Jack, we'll turn to you next. All right, great. Thanks, Brian, for that uh, overview. I was really encouraged by that, uh, the DEI efforts around having open, interdisciplinary, broad uh, scientific positions that you're hiring for, because that's 
that's a really great way to get some good candidates without making that job description so narrow that you that you just don't get that pool. So good good for you on that. I wanted to turn to that Center for uh, Ocean Observing Innovation. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, as we're well aware, there's lots of that happening in other agencies, NSF, NOAA, the Navy, et cetera. So I, as you described, I think this person's gonna be very busy staying in touch with all those activities. Yeah. I mean, I, I try to do that in my own career and it's, you know, it's two full-time jobs. So uh, yeah. it, they're gonna have to be, they're gonna have to be, uh, judicious about the kinds of things they're looking into. But just for example, yesterday we heard that great uh, NOAA presentation on the mm -hmm. fixed acoustic monitoring array. Mm -hmm. There are so many platforms out there already that BOEM could quite easily put acoustic devices on and really leverage things. So I guess to a specific question is there's the National Ocean Partnership Program. Mm -hmm. Is BOEM part of that or anticipates being part of it because it really is a great way to leverage innovation. Yes, yeah, thanks for that, Jack. Yeah, we're definitely part of the National Ocean Partnerships Program and Rodney can speak to that. But before I hand it over to him, you know, I do, you know, one of the things and the benefits of having somebody that's specifically focusing on innovation and as Les pointed out earlier is so many of our scientists are wearing multiple hats. They're trying to do it all. And, you know, as, as most of us realize, if you really want to be good and do good work in something, you actually have to do less of all the things and kind of focus on one or two things, right? And so I think that in some ways is one of the reasons why, you know, we um, identified this position as really critical is to help the Bureau as a whole you know, work on framing this and developing those overarching partnerships and things like that, that then our staff can work within that context and that framework. Because it is having been on that side of it, the COR, the scientist side of things, you are, you know, having the word of multiple hats and our scientists and our policy folks do a great job of it. But it is, it is really challenging to do it well, especially with things as complicated as you pointed out with the innovation and the number of people and, and partnerships that are there. But um, Rodney, I'll let you hop in and talk about the, or we have used NOP in the past and continue. I know that they're reevaluating and revamping the partnership program, so. Yeah, yeah, Jack, thanks for the question on, on NOP. Yeah, I was a co-chair for the National Ocean and Graphic Partnership Program for uh, like seven years, uh, so many years. Uh, and uh, and uh, right right now it's going through, uh, just for the, the report hasn't gone out public, but uh, it's got like a NOP uh, reboot, a NOP 2.0 mm -hmm. uh, that people are, are, are thinking about. Um, Dr. Yoko Furukawa, uh, who's a chief of our branch, um, of chemical and bio, I'm sorry, chemical and physical oceanography is is here on this call, and she's she's our member now, uh, along with uh, uh, John Lilly. So uh, you know we're currently involved in, in several NOP projects. Uh, you know we use it consistently. It again is one of these things that with other federal agencies with their own mandates, with their own uh, activities that they really prioritize, we have to find that alignment. You know, where's that sweet spot? So we might only find, uh, you know, one or so a year, uh, one type of study that really fits well with us. Um, we uh, have worked quite a bit uh, uh, under, under NOP through the uh, uh, NOMEC process, uh, National Oceanographic uh, Exploration and Characterization, um, I'm sorry, Mapping Exploration and Characterization. Um, that's something that, you know, we're working on and, and working with uh, other federal agencies like Office of Naval Research and NOAA uh, to, to, to do some type of studies with. So um, I, I guess one thing I, uh, you know, all this NOP and the NOMEC, this can get really complicated real quick. I'm happy to talk to you offline, but that falls under the subcommittee on ocean science and technology. That's like this umbrella subcommittee that I sit on that as a member. So you have the NOP committee, 
Uh, you have the NOMEC that's doing the mapping and exploration, and you have 10 other interagency working groups, everything from ocean education uh, to um, you know, looking at noise uh, and, and ocean sound, uh, and, and, and the list goes on and on. I don't want to go through all the, all the laundry list, but you know, all these interagency working groups you know, will work together in trying to find that alignment what kind of science uh, that the various agencies um, you know we can do together and then that kind of bubbles up through NOP so it'll get support from the bottom and then support from from, from me on the top as uh, so, so sitting in the on the on the sauce and then that's a lot of times how we really can can find those efforts that really make sense that uh, uh, agencies are really you know willing to contribute and and put funds in uh, the NOP process is long um, so if, as, as always, people are always in a hurry to do science and get out there. But, you know, if you're, if you're going through a NOP, just be, we have to, I have to tell people it's going to take a little bit longer. There's going to be different levels of, of peer review and you're going to have to work together to make, to meet everybody's needs. So it's not just going to be Bohm and Rodney sitting there going, this is the way it's going to be. And this is our need. And this, this is it. We have to work together, you know, with our partners from Navy or NASA or NOAA, so everybody can, you know, meet their need, and that kind of negotiation takes time. Um, but I think with this new um, NOP uh, 2.0 or, or reboot, uh, I think the push is going to be a little more towards more of kind of the applied side of, of science. How, how can we work together to use the science to inform national decisions? I hope that helps. I'm willing to talk offline if you want to, Jack. No, that's very helpful. Thanks for the overview. Right, I see uh, Bill's got his hand raised as well. So we'll hear from him and then from Les. Uh, thanks, Stacey. Yeah, I, I, I'm interested in uh, uh, any feedback that uh, this August group might have on, on centers uh, that relate to innovation. And um, so as I mean, as some of you know, we, uh, you know, Several years ago, we uh, decided that we we ought to consider creating centers in the environmental program. Uh, and you know, it's not a obvious thing. You know, that having a center will be a good thing. Uh, it uh, some of the staff that didn't think they would end up being participating within new centers were concerned that they. They might be, uh, you know, not as you know, prominent as as those that join centers, but 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 we th we we decided that you know for starters uh, a center for marine acoustics uh, would be low hanging fruit and uh, you know there, there's a real need to bring things together and there are many other players uh, that are into that NOAA and the Navy for example. And so we just, so we went for for the center and 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 Jill Lewandowski who I think was on earlier I don't see her now uh, I just went gangbusters and did a brilliant job at at uh, advancing it and it's actually fully staffed now I'm sure Jill would like more staff but it's <laughs> we actually achieved the staffing level that we planned for and it's it I I think it undeniably is 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 leading Bohm into. Uh, uh, a stronger and more innovative position when it comes to acoustic issues. It's, I mean, I just see that every day. And and now we, and now we have a, a center for innovative monitoring, uh, which I think I think uh, will be very valuable too. And of course, there are many players, but 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 uh, you know, we already have thoughts about, uh, for example, uh, an array of passive passive acoustic monitoring devices and so forth that I think are generally agreed would be a big ad advance. So, so I'm, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm curious uh, 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 what the uh, uh, COSA members or anyone else on the call sort of think about the centers. Thanks, so. Bill. We'll give folks just a minute or two maybe to think about that. I'll come to Les and then we'll come back to that, Bill, if that's all right. Yeah, sure, of course. Um, actually, Bill, that's where I was headed. <laughs> and um, one, of the, one of the fantastic things I've noticed about the Acoustic Center 
is that it sets up because because Jill is there, Erica. I mean, it sets up this situation where partners from outside can work colleague to colleague and speak the same language, where while the person inside Bohm has kind of a reality check on 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 what are Bohm's needs and how can we best work together. That that bridge has been critical. So if setting up a center is what's necessary to establish that bridge, I would say, yeah, if it's not necessary, maybe it's just something to, you know, Bohm could aspire to more broadly is to have more, more time for people to exercise their disciplinary strength in colleague to colleague relationships. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Les. Jack and then Carrie. Yeah, yeah, Bill, I think this fits perfectly in this conversation about the you know, best in class science strategy. You know, at the universities, we use that term center uh, actually pretty carefully to show what the university is interested in focusing on. And I think it does the same for you. It says, just like Les just said, it, it said, hey, we're focused on this. Come partner with us. So it may not be that you have a, a staff of 20, but you're but you have a focus and people know it and it allows you to do that. So I, I think it's a it's a good idea. I guess I was just, you know, knowing the staffing levels, I, I probably guessed that you couldn't put 20 people on it, but it would but it would allow that focus with the partners, as Les pointed out. Gotcha. Harry? Thanks. I'm really appreciating this discussion. And of course, I come at this thinking about applied social science. And I'm I'm wondering, Bill and others at BOEM, I, I guess I'm thinking about, gee, it would be really, and maybe there's something already in place, but I, I wonder about the possibility or the interest in having something like that that would address um, cultural resources, that would address um, human dimensions and socioeconomics in connection with Bohm's activities and priorities. I'm appreciating also the comment about capacity limitations and people's time and the wearing of many hats. Um, and to some extent, you know, would that be just too big a lift given everything else that Bohm wants to do? On the other hand, I think that could be a, a really, um, interesting and fruitful mechanism to consider. So I'm I'm interested to hear whether there's been any discussion about that or if that's something, and one other thought associated with that is thinking about these centers of excellence or centers of, of focus for the environmental studies program. Um, I guess the other is, and maybe this is already in place, is thinking about a partnership where somebody else would be doing the heavy lifting but where that kind of um, colleague to colleague within and across agency and other entity, other areas, other groups with expertise would be um, encouraged and, and hopefully help to support the efforts of BOEM staff. So anyway, tossing that out there. Thank you. Uh, uh, Stacy, if I can answer. K Carrie, thank you for bringing that point up. You know, it's, it occurs to me when we talk about a center for o ocean monitoring, most people probably think of, uh, you know, pH, temperature, uh, you know, the, <clears throat> the uh, presence or absence of certain kinds of organisms. And we do, and we, we certainly, you know, intend to include that, but we've had a lot of discussion and I think have presumed that, that the, uh, the center would also address uh, uh, cultural, the human dimensions, which, which does make it more complicated and, and, not only in terms of data, because uh, as, you, as I think you probably know, we have a ecosystem-based management uh, study underway, and, when, and the idea is to have a model to be part of that and link it to our our status of the OCS initiative. And, and um, uh, you know, one of the questions is, how you know, how do you address uh, uh, tribal? Uh, issues and something like that, and we'd like to cover it, but it's uh, but if you, but if you link a decision making model, uh, 
the task of assigning priority is really difficult. Uh, but the basic monitoring and, you know, so here, so that's an interesting quest that we're very interested in. We need all the help we can because it's, you know, it's tricky. How, you know, what should you monitor? What, you know, what are the most important things that are, uh, you know, social, economic, cultural, uh, you know, which, which actually for better or worse, Bum thinks of the environment that way. It's, it's, we could probably blame, blame it on Oxla, which has marine, coastal and human environment in its, in its terms. So, uh, but I think that's the basic concept. Scott, I think I saw that you'd put a comment in the chat. Did you want to say anything in the discussion about centers? Oh, I, I was just going to say that that uh, in at least in industry, uh, I, I've been involved with a number of different kinds of centers uh, that were we were brought together. Uh, uh, te technical experts, scientific experts, uh, focused on a particular challenge usually, and and we found it a great way to uh, kind of a, attract the very top talent and and also to retain them. People generally found that form of recognition to be very um, uh, gratifying, and and so uh, and I was just wondering if are you are you starting to see some impact with the uh, have you got any feedback like that from the center for marine acoustics, which is been up and running now for a while. Yeah, I mean, actually, if Jill's on uh, or, or Erica, and you know, I, I think for everybody that listened to Erica's presentation yesterday, it was amazing. But, but I will say, not assuming that they're on this call right now, they have. I mean, they, they're, they're, you know, requests, interests, partnership are, uh, are uh, basically pouring in. And uh, you know, one of my challenges is to make sure people know they're actually part of BOEM now, <laughs> which is a mostly a good thing. That's mostly a good thing. <laughs> Kevin, I see your hand is raised. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, I think the, uh, you know, the, the idea of centers and the question of centers is a, is a really interesting one. I've been involved with a a few of them. I was in the uh, Center of Excellence up in Canada for called Open for Ocean Production and Enhancement Network. And sometimes, you know, I, I think that in developing centers, you need to think about, you know, kind of your 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 target of how many. Because I have found in in some of these bigger centers, you get too many people, and it ends up that just a, a few people either dominate the conversation or or carry the ball. And so it, it's kind of Think that in creating them you have to you have to have a bit of a focus on on um you know on on the selection and 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 the type of people with the with the aim of the the sum being greater than the parts i i scott will scott will appreciate this i always think about it like a rock and roll band a great band where you know the beatles each individual beetle was good but together they were really something else you know and so i think i think that it it does take a little thought in the structure and, and also the medium in which you're going to communicate, whether you're going to have in-person or Zoom meetings, because those will, those will dictate both the kind of the people and interactions and also the, the ability to communicate. So, but I've always, I've been fascinated with how many, how many people, how, how it's like with teaching, like, you know, is your optimal size of a, a, a class 18 or is it 29? You know, what is the, is the optimal group and what are the skills, the particular skills you need to get to the, the point you're trying to get at. Anyway, so this is just a few thoughts on that. Yeah. Yeah, Kevin, that's a that's really a good point. And I think that one of the reasons that um, CMA has been so successful is that DA has worked for a long time on its its organizational culture and the type of people it hires. And, you know, one of the things we look at is not only, you know, are they good at what they do, but how they do it and how they work with others is equally as important. And so I think that that's one of the key things that, you know, I know Jill has been really cognizant on in, in hiring is hiring the people with the right expertise, but the right way of doing things and how they work together, you know, in a team environment and whether they're resilient and you know adaptable and flexible and those type of things because the work is challenging and it's 
comes at you from all different places and you have to be able to, you know, work together as a unit. And so I think you're seeing a lot of that. It pays dividends to spend a lot of time focusing on some of the softer skills and evaluating those during the hiring process um, uh, because you have a long-term commitment once you bring somebody on board in a long-term relationship. So thanks. Thanks, Brian Rodney. Yeah, Kevin, I think that's a really good point too. And, uh, you know, th this is, that's one reason we, we wanted to uh, start with a new position, a director, this, this individual that can come in that really has, I think, uh, <clears throat> hopefully we'll have a really good understanding of new and emerging technologies where they would advise and uh, work on the, uh, the build out of the new center. Um, you know, I mean, just, you know, we hope to have more people to, in, in it down the road, but I don't know uh, what that'll look like. It may be just a few or whatever, but, you know, I, I think to start kind of at the, at the top and then think about that build out, again, touching all the disciplines, whether that's social, cultural, uh, biological, physical, chemical oceanography, you know, the, the whole uh, spectrum of innovation and technology, I think is going to be important. Uh, but I don't envision it being huge uh, down the road. Uh, I mean, at this point, uh, but I think, uh, you know, I, I think uh, Jack mentioned it earlier, but, uh, you know, none of our people right now really have the bandwidth to do this. This is like a separate job in and of themselves uh, to do their studies and also to keep up with all the technology that's, uh, that's emerging right now in their, you know, respective discipline. So to have this new position, an individual come in that's focused on that, that can help institutionalize it across BOEM, reach out to other federal agencies, the private sector, developers, you know, across the board, and then advise and, and help our scientists, I think, uh, you know, could be extremely fruit, you know, you know, fruitful down the road. <clears throat> Thanks. That sounds like you need a, a connector there, Rodney. Uh, sounds like a you know someone with the, those particular skills to connect, connect uh -huh. other, uh, other ones. Selecting a leader, boy, that's I've been on a couple of dean searches, and I have to say we've kind of at times we failed miserably. It's it's very <laughs> hard to pick a leader. Right. Yeah. No, I hear you. I hear. You. <laughs> connector is a good word for it. I think. Yeah. Well, this has been an inc incredibly fruitful discussion, I think. Certainly, I know, as I mentioned earlier, um, COSA members, particularly our returning COSA members, have been really excited and eager to hear the updates um, since originally being briefed on the first in class study. Um, Brian, thank you and your colleagues for all the work that you put into that presentation, highlighting uh, several specific areas of development and more generally running through um, how BOEM's approaching those recommendations. Very much appreciated. It's two o'clock now uh, and we are scheduled to take a break and then when we get back um, we will have uh, some briefings on the new National Academies projects that are underway and that are being sponsored by BOEM. Um, we'll hear from Caroline Bell and Jim Centurico about the new standing committee and then from Kelly Oxbig uh, regarding our very quick turnaround study on uh, wind turbines, hydrodynamics, and uh, potential impacts on prey availability. Um, so I will leave those to them to describe, but uh, that's what we have to look forward to on the other side of the break. Um, and then we will uh, keep the remainder of the afternoon relatively short and uh, COSA members will move into a closed session discussion at 3.30. So with that, I invite folks to take 15 minutes um, and we will return promptly at 2.15 Eastern. Give folks maybe just another moment or so. And real quick, Caroline, I'm just gonna ask if you thought we were um, going to expect Jim today or not. Um, he did say that he should be able to make it just for this portion of the meeting. Okay. And good thing he didn't say anything about oh. me because I'm here. <laughs>
Very good to have you on. I was looking in the J's but didn't see you. So you must have uh, risen to the top of the participant list already. That's perfect. Excellent. Well, let's um, go ahead and get started. I'm thrilled to have two of my National Academy's colleagues on the line with us today, Caroline Bell, who uh, will be co-presenting first with um, her new committee chair, Jim Centurico, and Kelly Oskvig, uh, who will be presenting second um, on her new uh, upcoming study. And I will let uh, each of them introduce themselves, but I just wanted to take a moment to thank them for coming to talk to the committee and uh, others on the line about these new and upcoming National Academies projects that are getting underway. So Caroline, with that, I'm happy to turn it over to you and Jim for introductions and um, you're welcome to take it from there. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, as Stacy mentioned, my name is Caroline Bell. I'm um, fairly new to the National Academies. I'm an associate um, program officer in the Ocean Studies Board and uh, the responsible staff officer for the new Standing Committee on Offshore Wind, Energy, and Fisheries um, that we just had our first meeting um, with the committee last week. So just starting starting this new Standing Committee. And I'll turn it over and let Jim introduce himself. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Jim Sankirigo. I'm a faculty member at the University of California at Davis. I'm a natural resource economist by training. I am also part of the Ocean Studies Board. All right, and let me share a few slides. All right. All right, so I guess I'm gonna go Carolyn, is that, we're good? Yep, sounds good. All right, first of all, thank you for inviting us to come uh, to sort of brief you. We just got uh, started. We actually have had one closed session meeting and it's the end of my quarter. So I believe it was last week, but it, it's all sort of blurry. Um, and uh, I will sort of comment, uh, the committee of course is public. You can go on the website uh, for us and you could find everyone's names. I think I would, I mean, not I think, I know I was very impressed by the diversity that we have and the expertise that we have uh, on the committee. We have a list of sort of uh, what each area of uh, expert sort of covers each member, but in fact, it's a very multi-dimensional Venn diagram with a lot of us covering multiple topics. Uh, multiple fisheries, multiple areas, uh, large marine ecosystems across uh, the U.S. But, uh, you know, it's going to be a great group. We're excited uh, to get going. And I guess we can move on to the statement of task. So uh, some of these bullets seem very familiar uh, for you, I'm sure, because they sound and re read a lot like some of your statement of task. Uh, unlike you, though, we are very specific with regards to offshore wind and fisheries, where you guys seem to be much more general. Um, and we are, you know, set up like you to provide export assessment of developments in sort of natural and social science and technology with regards to offshore wind and fishery issues. And one of, I think one of the key things uh, that we are going to be able to do is this last bullet is really go out and engage the stakeholders based on the committee membership and the expertise they have uh, in different fisheries uh, around the country. I really think that this is where, uh, you know, we will shine and be able to really service BOEM is on the stakeholder understanding and insights and, and really getting them uh, talking to people out in the field. Next slide. And I think, okay, that's it for me. <laughs> So right. we have an, uh, I'll just say we have the two meetings coming up and why don't you talk about what they are and the goals are. Yep, absolutely. Right. So our first open meeting um, will be April 13th. Um, time right now is 3 to 4.30 p.m., but um, stay tuned to the website for um, final details on that. And this will be our first sponsor briefing from um, BOEM to the committee. So we'll hear um, from 
uh, various leadership positions uh, within BOEM, and then also uh, the plan, I believe, is to have some regional representation um, share sort of what's going on uh, in the different regions around the country with offshore wind um, currently. So our committee gets a good understanding of um, sort of where BOEM is coming from um, in, in, you know, what the starting point is. Um, and there'll also be time for our committee members to um, ask clarifying questions and understand more of um, what BOEM sees the role of our new standing committee uh, on offshore wind energy and fisheries. And then the second meeting um, is our larger spring hybrid meeting, and that'll be April 26th and 27th. Um, again, the times will be posted on our website as we plan that, and then also more details about um, the topics for that meeting will be coming um, down the line as we discuss with BOEM and the committee um, kind of what the the first things that we want to cover as a offshore wind and fisheries committee are going to be. So I will stop sharing my screen and Stacey, that's all that we had presented. Do we want to answer, have time for questions now or later? Thanks, Carrie. <laughs> um, yes, we can certainly take a few questions now uh, and, and maybe share some thoughts. I think, you know, primarily this group just wants to ensure uh, that we are communicative with you all and, and sort of develop a relationship to exchange information and exchange thoughts on priorities and um, how we can be, um, you know, just stay in the loop about what each of the uh, respective committees is up to and how that might inform each other's work. So um, with that, if there's any immediate questions, I see Scott's raised his hand, I'll turn to him first. Yeah, I'm always a troublemaker. <laughs> uh, so uh, welcome to you both. And we're, we're very excited. I will say, uh, I think on behalf of COSA, we are very excited to have your committee kick off and we look forward to working with you. Uh, there's uh, plenty of plenty of work to do to help BOEM achieve their mission. And you're focusing on a very important part of that uh, challenge right now. So we're, we're glad to have you uh, engaged. And I, I guess what I would offer is that, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're available to you to be a resource. And I guess I'd also ask a question to, to uh, our two uh, National Academy leads here. Is there any, any reason that we cannot communicate uh, 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 via email directly with members of the other uh, other committee if we ha if we see there are opportunities for the two standing committees to help each other out. Um, I, I welcome Caroline's thought on this as well, but um, no, I don't think there's any any reason to um, to prohibit that or or to say no. The one the one thing I would suggest is that Caroline and or I be cc'd on those communications Absolute. just Absolutely. to ensure that we're all staying in the loop, um, but there's nothing to guard uh, us from, from having that type of engagement right. and interaction with one another. Jim? So I want to sort of follow up on that um, with regards to how are we going to implement the communication to make sure that we are actually uh, staying engaged with each other. And I guess I don't understand uh, BOEM yet to, under, to know how much overlap are there people that there are interacting, the ones that are sort of our chief uh, sponsors and proponents within BOEM. Um, and is that something that would be nice to have overlap on their side also? And then how we do you two plan on making sure that we know what you guys are doing? Like, for example, you guys did offshore wind, it looked like yesterday. Um, and is that anything relevant for us to know as a committee moving forward from that conversation? It seems like um, we are going to overlap a lot, even though they are broader. I mean, offshore wind is and fisheries is a pretty big issue right now. And so, you know, it'd be nice to think through what that communication uh, implementation and channels are going to be. And who's Absolutely. responsible for push that? Well, let me, um, I saw Jessica uh, Bravo put herself on uh, camera. So let me let her mm -hmm. respond from the BOEM perspective and then I'll try to tackle uh, the, the National Academy's perspective as well. 
Sure. And uh, Jim, it's very nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Jessica Bravo. I work for the BOEMS um, Office of Envi Environmental Programs as the Chief of Staff. And um, I actually uh, manage BOEM's relationship with the National Academies. I'm the, the core on the overall IDIQ, um, and I am a core on a number of additional tasks under that IDIQ. Um, and so I've been, you know, in close communications with Caroline as the um, committee formation was discussed, uh, making sure that um, the other BOEM folks were kind of up to date on the latest with, uh, you know, BOEM's relationship with the National Academies, any constraints that the National Academies might have, insights from my experience working with COSA. And um, I'm going to stay plugged in with that because I want to make sure that uh, the BOEM team uh, is supported um, in that to make sure that uh, BOEM is showing up strong um, and providing you guys what you need um, and making sure that um, that the link exists between uh, these two committees, um, at least from the BOEM perspective. Um, and I imagine um, Stacy and Caroline will, will serve a similar role as well. And then of course, I always make sure to loop in the other National Academy staff as appropriate. Um, so that's from the BOEM side, nice to meet you. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just note one thing that I think can work well um, and maybe something uh, we want to, our respective committees might want to consider uh, is having some sort of liaison to the other, um, you know, at least somebody that would uh, be available to join the open sessions of the respective committees. Um, certainly, I think that can be a strategy. Uh, it, it may not be that we need to have the same person at every meeting, it would double their work. Um, but at least to you know be thinking about when their dates are and see if we have members from our committee, uh, one or more that, that might want to join the open session. And you all would be, of course, welcome to join the open sessions of our meetings as well. Um, and then, of course, Caroline and I, we meet regularly in our regular staff meetings um, and can certainly communicate um, beyond that as well. Caroline, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Um, yep, I just wanted to uh, yeah, kind of reiterate what Stacy has mentioned that um, you know we've done a pretty good job so far as I was forming this committee, um, and and they had a, a meeting. Um, I'm not sure exactly when your last meeting was, Stacy, where there were some offshore wind um, issues that came up that I will share with um, our offshore uh, wind energy committee. Um, so I think we are going to have um, a pretty good working relationship, and and Stacy and I will definitely communicate and keep. Um, you know, the chairs in the loop. And then uh, I like the idea of a liaison as well um, to at least have one member um, participate in the, the committee meeting. So I'll make sure to share um, more details about our committee meeting dates, times as that gets finalized um, with, with Stacy and the COSA committee. In, in fact, uh, let me, let me uh, also vote for that liaison role. That's uh, actually can be very, very, very useful. Uh, in fact, I got on to COSA started out as the liaison from Beezer, yeah. the board on Earth Science and Resources to COSA. I haven't gotten off, but at the end of this year, I finally will. Um, but it can be very, very helpful for continuity and, and um, you know, somebody who has can be the bridge between. I think that would be, a, it, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to bring the two committees together because we've got plenty to do and, and uh, we need, we need to, Work, we work, we need to work in lockstep on this stuff. So, before less you go, I just want to reiterate I agree. I think the liaison will be a really good thing. And Caroline, we could bring that up at our next meeting. Yep. But I don't think Chris will use you as a selling point, your history <laughs> for the liaison, <laughs> uh, the lifelong commitment. But yeah, I think it's good. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't. Les, we'll turn to you next. Yeah, thanks. Um, can't make my hand go down. Oh, there you go. Uh, Jim, hi. Um, maybe this is part of the remit for the liaison, but there are four areas that would be really useful to hear about. And I think this is kind of the way some of the discussion is being structured in Rhoda also, uh, and Rosa, and that is um, working waterfront what's going on inside AWEA in terms of allowed fishing practices or feasible fishing practices? Uh, what is the effect of any exclusion from the WIA to the immediate area around it? 
And then what does distal displacement look like? Thanks. I've jotted down those notes. Yep. Thanks. Basically, on mute. Goodness, one of these days I'm going to learn how to use Zoom. If it hasn't happened yet, though. Um, no, I was just going to say, uh, Les, thank you for those those suggested input. Um, I think certainly, Caroline, Jim, you all, uh, even with, with what seems like a fairly abbreviated statement of task, you, you have your hands very full already. Um, but we are eager to stay in the loop and you know, watch and understand how you all are approaching some of these topics um, and certainly to stay engaged and also to understand where some of the um, topics that you're covering might have broader implications for bone science and assessments as well and, and you know, how we can help with that. Any other thoughts or questions while we've got Caroline and Jim on the line regarding the upcoming, the new standing committee? Won't call it upcoming anymore. Here. <laughs> well, well, I had one more thought for Jim here, uh, and, and uh, it, about uh, the um, you know, uh, Boehm has recently, of course, moved into offshore wind in a really big way. I mean, it's a huge. It's been a huge move for them. It's and in fact, it seems to be dominating. It's the dominant activity for them right now. It's the dominant focus. But they are adding new program areas beyond that that are going to come onto their remit where fishing it will probably be an issue as well. So if it, next next fall, we just heard from the director yesterday that they will be coming out with their new regs uh, and strategies around uh, offshore carbon capture and sequestration. What will that look like? It could be huge. Uh, the areas that are most of interest for that uh, lie in the Atlantic sh continental shelf and the Gulf of Mexico continental shelf. And they, uh, I, I suspect we'll hear something about, about that. So we may have some, there could be some interesting issues there. So your learnings as you kick your committee off are going to be very relevant, um, you know, for what might come down for things that we have to consider later on. Um, in addition to that, we're going to be looking, uh, the, BOMA's looking to expanding their activities into uh, farther flung U.S. territories. That they haven't had to look after before, and potentially into critical minerals as well, and um, that may get a little further afield of, of some of the uh, areas around fishing. But there may well be significant critical mineral uh, um, uh, resources, for instance, up in Alaska, where we still have a lot of fishing going on. So um, uh, I, I think it's going to be important for for Boehm that that we all keep in, in touch because I think. What you guys are learning could help inform us considerably as well. So thanks again. We're looking looking forward to working with you all. Thank you. That's great. One last opportunity for any additional questions or comments. And I, you know, invite thoughts, uh, thoughts and questions from the BOEM staff as well. I know we've got lots of folks on the line. So um, give them a moment. Great. Well, with that, um, Jim and Caroline, thank you. I think this is the beginning of the conversation with you all. Um, and, you know, maybe in our closed session today, we can uh, identify one or more folks that's able to join your um, upcoming meeting and then uh, keep them posted in terms of the timing, precise timing of those. Um, and then I will next turn to Kelly Oxvig, who's on the line and will be leading uh, the very fast track study uh, looking at the hydrodynamic impacts of wind turbines. So Kelly, with that, I'm uh, very happy to turn it over to you. Excellent. Um, thank you. And uh, thanks everyone for having me. Um, I have, we are even earlier <laughs> in the stage of this project uh, than Caroline's. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick overview of this study that just um, got underway and will, like Stacey said, will be done at a very quick pace, um, delivering our report uh, this fall, later this fall in October. Um, 
So let's see, am I sharing the right screen first? Am yes, you are. It looks <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So, um, so Bohm has asked us to undertake a consensus study to understand the potential effects of offshore fixed bottom wind turbines on the marine hydrodynamics. Um, specifically in the Nantucket Shoals region. And this is for the purpose of understanding the impacts that these hydrodynamic changes may have on marine mammals and specifically the North Atlantic right whale prey. So I'll just give you a quick overview of what we're gonna do and where we are. Um, so this project is sponsored by BOEM. Um, it's a 12 month fast track consensus study um, and that that fast track designation for us means um, that we go to the front of the line um, during any of the academy's process type things. So it enables uh, the committee, the committee knows to work fast and then the, the academies is behind us to support us in getting this um, work done as quickly as possible. Um, the performance period it just started March 2nd um, of this year, and it will end March 1st of 2024. Um, we are looking to assemble a committee of 10 to 12 experts. Um, the call for nominations closed last Wednesday on the 15th, um, and we've been very busy sorting through the nominations and interviewing um, candidates to you know, put together um, a matrix of, of um, committee members that cover the expertise and, um, and the diversity that we need to complete the statement of task. Um, so this committee is planned to have four uh, meetings in total, um, four two-day meetings. Two of those will be hybrid. Um, hopefully many, many people can travel and meet in person, and then two of those meetings will be virtual. Um, and as I said, the, the pre-publication, which is the, the final peer-reviewed text of the report, will be due in early October. Um, and then it'll be handed to Bohm and obviously also released to the public at that time. Um, and then our final report um, is due by February 1st, uh, 2024. And if anybody has any questions, just raise your hand. Um, let's see. Sorry. I would need to slide. There we go. Okay, so here's our statement of task. Um, the committee will start by conducting a literature review to summarize the state of science uh, regarding the direct and indirect effects of offshore wind turbine structures on hydrodynamic processes, um, and then the scale of that change in relation to natural variability. Um, the committee will then comment on the extent to which we can estimate changes to the hydrodynamics, as well as the resulting changes to ecosystem dynamics. Um, and looking at models currently used in environmental impact statement analysis, the committee will be asking questions like how do the methods, assumptions, and conclusions from those models translate to the Nantucket Shoals area? How well um, do existing models meet the needs? Um, should we be looking at other models? Um, and what should be done in the future to uh, be able to assess the hydrodynamic impacts of wind uh, turbine generators in this area? Um, and here's our project timeline. Um, I've kind of circled where we are right now. Um, we are in the process of vetting candidates and putting together that committee slate. I'm trying to finish that by the end of this month so that we can get approvals, um, announce that committee membership and have the first meeting. Ideally, that first meeting will be in April. Um, and we will just keep chugging along uh, a meeting a month, uh, basically, and sending our um, report out for review in the late summer time frame, responding to review in September and releasing this to BOEM as soon as we are able. Um, and I've, I've met with a lot of <laughs> potential committee members and though everyone realizes this is a little aggressive, everyone's um, not, no one's been frightened off yet. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it's a tight statement of task. It's focused um, and, uh, you know, people seem to be uh, appreciative of the need. Um, and excited to join. So we're very excited to kick this off. Um, and I think I might have one more soon. Oh, yeah. Um, we have a project website like all our projects um, where we will post the committee membership. And that's where if you had a comment on the committee, um, you could uh, submit it there. We'll have um, upcoming meetings and registration links and everything like that um, related to the committee's work on a project website. 
Um, and you're always welcome to reach out to me if you have any questions or comments. Um, and uh, yeah, um, thanks for having me. And I, I welcome any questions or comments you have now. I'm going to stop sharing this video. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kelly. I appreciate yeah. you uh, bringing folks up to speed and helping illustrate <laughs> just how quick of a turnaround this will be for you all. I'm thrilled to hear that your committee membership searches are going well despite despite the intimidating time frame. Um, any any questions from our COSA members or guests? Les, go ahead. Yeah, hi Kelly. Um, is is there a connection between this work and I think it was BOM funded, but I'm not sure. A new study uh, through the Stellag and Meg Nashman Sanctuary of driving factors for right whale based on oceanography in the southern Gulf of Maine. Um, I could let Bohm speak to this more, but this topic has come up, but there hasn't been a specific coordinated effort with the study. But if um, the folks from Bohm want have anything further to add to that. No, yeah, I'm also just wondering, it's, it's interesting because it's such a different system. And I forgot who told me yesterday that they were eating gamma rids uh, on Nantucket Shoals, which was really startling to me. Thank you, Les. I think I thought, Yoko, did you raise your hand or were you um, just otherwise reacting? Go ahead. Oh, we can't hear you. No. Could you be double muted by chance? Is there another? Okay. Well, we are definitely interested in your input. So if you'd like to put it in the chat or raise your hand again when you've yeah. got your. Oh, oh, we can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. That's weird. I didn't do anything. I just. Maybe it's the time. Uh, yeah, um, thank you for the question, Les. So, um, oh, so as far as um, Bowen Environmental Studies Program um, is concerned, this physical oceanography, so the, the relationship or the effect of physical oceanography on a lot of the, um, the creatures that we are concerned about have come to us very rapidly. So we have had, um, you know, so, Every time there is a new um, a coal area or a potential um, wind energy area comes up, we did do a baseline physical oceanography study, but not necessarily in the context of how the prey aggregation might happen. So that became um, a hot topic very recently. So this is coming up fast. So even though there is not an explicit relationship with the, the main, the Gulf of Maine study and this current um, study that Kelly just talked about, it is all within the, the big context of now we are, uh, we have a concerted effort to understand the physical oceanography in the context of the prey aggregation. Thank you. Thank you, Yoko. Uh, Jack and then Scott. Yeah, thanks Kelly for that description. So uh, quick question, limited to fixed bottom turbines. Uh, how, why was that decision made? Because certainly, you know, we're going to need to deal with floating soon enough. Um, I can I can let Bone answer that one. Um. Yeah, and Yoko, you can jump in because I know you know a lot more context than I do, but I do know that this had to do with timing of the study. We needed the, the information for some of the project areas that are um, in the New England area, which are farther along in their advancement. But I do know that we have a, a longer term view on this question as well, and we do have ideas about how we can build upon this work. Yoko, what would, what would you add? Nothing to add. That's it. Thank okay, you. Okay, perfect. <laughs> and then, to, you know, to the to the phys bio connections, you know, the model's got to have the biology in it. So that, that's not so clear to me. Is that in the mandate too, Yoko? So the, the study that Kelly talked about or the further other physical oceanography studies in general? Uh, well, in the in the description, it says, you know, will it affect the prey fields? And, and Les asked a question about prey fields. So I'm wondering, does the consideration of the models include those that go all the way through the biology? 
yes, yes. So the the as the Kelly's um, current study that Kelly's reviewing, as well as the physical oceanography study that we're planning, we're designing right now for 23 as well as 24 and beyond. Yes, the uh, the biogeochemical uh, models are going to be part of them. Okay, yeah, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, well, thanks, Kelly, for giving this overview. Uh, given what we heard yesterday and the uh, discussions we had about uh, the, the, the tremendous threat to the right whales uh, all along the East Coast, um, I, I'm a, I'm anticipating. I, I I assume, Jessica, this is this study is really driven by specific decisions Bohm has to make pretty shortly uh, relative to the 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 next steps in the Nantucket project, right? And this is one of your more mature ones, further along than many. How, um, two, so sort of two questions. How, um, how similar are, is the, are, is, are the water depths and, and, uh, you know, turbine height um, uh, of Nantucket to other projects in, in the nearby area? How easily we will we'll be able to apply some of the lessons learned from this one to some of the other decisions and projects you have coming up? Um, and, and is there, is there, um, uh, any, any thought about trying to do some sensitivity analysis here or while you're out there to just sort of see what it would be? I know, cause I know some places you're looking at, uh, bigger, bigger, uh, options for bigger turbines, huh? And, and, uh, and particularly with some of the newer projects that might be in similar water depths and similar spacing, uh, is that, is that, is that part of the scope as well? That's really for Kelly or or Jessica or, or any of you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll I'll let Bohm speak to the to the other areas. Uh, okay, so so as far as the the biogeochemical, so the physical regimes and and as a result, the biogeochemical regimes are going to be very different depending on the okay. depths, depending on. The, the relationship to the coastline and how the turbines are going to be built out. So obviously the turbine build out can be something that you can model based on your physical and biogeochemical regimes, but those need to be established fairly site specifically. So you'll probably need to do a, a similar kind of study and modeling uh, for the other projects as well, is that correct? Is, and we are this, planning. This on is doing sort that. of this is serial number one then of a of a of a kind of a an, an analytical approach you're going to be replicating. And so in uh, in this fiscal year 23, for example, we are now designing a, a physical oceanography and biogeochemical modeling study in the the coast of California, where the you know the recently there are these. Um, Activities there, so yes, we are doing in all oh. areas. Okay, so you're anticipating this gets back to the other the question we we had before about getting looking at some some floating uh, wind sites as well. How huh? that's on the radar screen as a follow up to this one. Certainly. So so one of one of the issues. So I think this came up at the maybe two COSA meetings ago that there was a lot of discussion about how the wind turbine might. Uh, interact the, the the air sea interaction due to the wind turbines might affect the coastal upwelling. So that was uh, specific to the uh, California coast. So okay. that that's part of that study that I just mentioned. Okay. And the spacing here, I'm sorry, the spacing here is a one mile grid. Is that right? It's a one mile grid, right? The turbines. For California or for no, in, 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 in Nantucket, they're one mile apart. That I don't know. That would be a question for Kelly or Jessica, perhaps. I don't know the specific there. I haven't reviewed the project design envelope for that specific area. Um, I don't know, Kelly, have you heard gotten that level of detail yet? I assume not yet. No, no, we need to get that. <laughs> okay. okay. It looks All like right, Bill, thanks, Bill thanks hopped in, so he might have some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Information. Uh, Scott, I think, yeah, you know, what, what we're talking about, I, uh, 
actually, I haven't read the details of, of this one, but we're talking about the leases that are around Nantucket Shoals. So, you know, right. there are a number of them. And I believe, I believe they're all one nautical mile space. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks. You've got any additional questions for Kelly regarding the study as it's plotted to go forward? Kelly, any questions for us as you're, you know, putting your committee together or any, you know, things that we can help with in, in that regard or in the early meetings? Um, we'd be happy to do so. So keep us posted. Yeah, I will. I'll um, I'll let you know once the uh, the committee's assembled. I don't think I can I need anything right now, but um, as we're planning for our information gathering session, which will be that second meeting, um, I think that your input would be most welcome. Um, and I'll make sure that you all have um, the agendas for the, the first open meeting as well. Excellent. Yeah, so thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for joining. Stacey, you're on mute. This is not my day today. <laughs> um, I just wanted to thank you, Kelly, again, um, and also to thank Caroline and Jim for joining us for this session, too. I know both of these projects have been, you know, highly anticipated. Uh, by our group and um, certainly things we want to keep on the radar and keep track of as well as they progress um, and, and evolve. Um, so I think we're scheduled at three o'clock to have some um, concluding remarks. And um, I just, you know, again, um, we, we had a, a pretty lengthy day yesterday, really focused on uh, issues surrounding uh, acoustic impacts from wind energy development and um, some of the recent uh, strandings and uh, other incidents with, with uh, whales in particular and other cetaceans. Um, and I, I think it was a really productive discussion. There's still a lot left to chew on in that, in that regard. And I think we're all very eager still to, um, to see how, how BOEM deals with some of the issues that they're encountering um, and some of the communications issues in particular. I know that came up yesterday um, and it's something that we're uh, happy to help folks think through as well. Um, and then today has been, a, oh, what a great session we had this morning uh, hearing the updates from first in class, Brian and, and Jessica um, and uh, Jonathan and others. Thank you for putting that all together. Um, and then, and, and then uh, hearing from my National Academy colleagues, getting to uh, get a flavor of what's to come uh, with each of those projects. So I just, again, want to thank everybody that, that's had a hand in, in pulling this meeting together um, and want to be sure to uh, keep folks um, aware of things that are, are up, um, up and coming for us. We will have our next meeting uh, will be our summer meeting celebrating the 50th anniversary, I believe, if I've got that right, Jessica and Rodney uh, and others, for the um, Environmental Sciences Program. So uh, really looking forward to potentially having that meeting in person in D.C. Um, and uh, getting to see what new project BOEM is proposing or, or considering proposing, putting forward uh, for the next uh, National Studies List. So. Um, that's what's next on, on our calendars. I know, Jessica, we had talked uh, following our last meeting about a potential workshop on the cumulative impacts to the human environment. Um, I think we're still maybe waiting to hear to see if that's something BOEM would like to pursue. Um, otherwise, I know we'll be in touch further about the um, fall and spring, fall 2023, spring 2024 um, meetings as well. But that's that's all I've got. Jessica, anything? You turned your camera on, so I want to give you a chance if there's anything you wanted to add. No, nothing to add um, on, on updates, but just a, a, a huge 
gratitude for the, the COSA members, all of the external uh, guests who came in to provide some informal advice, and a huge welcome to all of our new COSA members. We look forward to getting to further know you. It's been really great seeing kind of what questions you have already, um, and so uh, well, welcome. I'll turn it to Scott and Rod for any additional uh, concluding thoughts or remarks. I just want to uh, extend again uh, my thanks to to the uh, to everybody involved, all the folks at at, at Bohm who've been uh, participating uh, and making these uh, very helpful presentations yesterday and today. They were all excellent, and we learned a lot. Our outside panelists uh, uh, from the other agencies, folks from the other agencies, as well as the external pan panelists, great contributions, much appreciated. And and uh, uh, looking and and also this afternoon learning about what else uh, is going on at the academy uh, on the on the wind and uh, bohm front is 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 very helpful. Looking forward to working uh, with yeah. with both of those those two new, new groups uh, yeah. and yeah, uh, that's looking, I know looking forward to seeing uh, all of all of you at bohm uh, in in uh, the D.C. area this summer. So that'll be exciting. Fingers. Cross. Yeah, I just want to echo that. Thank you, everyone at Boehm. I know it's a lot of work putting these things together and also in the National Academies for all your hard work. Um, thanks to our external experts. That was uh, their contributions are always terrific. Um, thanks to Caroline and Jim and Kelly this afternoon. Um, I was particularly interested in the in Boehm's response and work with the first in class report. Um, I noticed there were there was some comment about capacity and workforce that also is obviously very, very important given the expanding tasks that Boehm has. I was I was um heartened to hear about partnerships and collaborations with the tribes and also the progress in in uh, in in Jedi. Um, and and also I heard potential partnerships with um, HBCUs, which I think is also very, very interesting. So again, thanks to everybody for a um, uh, very interesting and informative two days, and we look forward to continuing to work with you over the next few months leading up to the summer. Absolutely. Um, I think we're scheduled, uh, the committee is scheduled to reconvene in a closed session at 3.30. I'm happy to uh, go ahead and adjourn our open session a little bit early, give most folks uh, 15 minutes of their day back and uh, give our COSA folks a little bit of a, a longer break than anticipated. Um, unless there's any other comments, thoughts, or feedback folks would like to provide here at the end. All right. With that, um, I will say uh, thank you again, and we will see the um, committee members in closed session for our COIN committee balance discussion at 3.30.